double down uh, on our efforts to catch up with uh, science and technology and innovation. Science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. Uh, the problem being that, you know, while uh, we have our uh, PhDs here, there aren't enough of us. And um, everywhere else in the world, for research to be successful, you need a complete research group. It's very important that the uh, PASA members and uh, scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities um, that the Filipinos can have to uh, do science um, with their PASA counterparts. I think um, that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country. The role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. We really need to ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to uh, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good, the, the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. Good morning, Philippines, and good evening, USA. Uh, PAASIREC 11 welcomes you to a webinar on COVID-19, the first year and beyond. We have a powerhouse of accomplished speakers who are advocates of public and global health. I'm your moderator, Yasmin Ronquillo. COVID-19 is a public health problem that has taken an immense toll on all of us. Our speakers may not have all the answers to our questions, but we are honored that they are willing to shed light on health policies during this pandemic. All of our speakers graduated from the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines, Manila. They have published scientific articles in their field of expertise. To open our webinar, uh, Dr. Francisco C. will present part one, Critical Lessons Learned. He will also be the last speaker and present um, part two. Let me just share my screen here. So Dr. Francisco C. is professor and the chair of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the University of Nevada. He is also the 2020 most outstanding alumnus of his alma mater, the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. He is uniquely qualified. He once served at both the US NIH and the US CDC which are federal institutions at the forefront of the COVID-19 policies of the United States. At the US NIH, Dr. C was the director of extramural activities and scientific programs of the Minority Health and Health Disparities um, Institute. Dr. C received the NIH Director's Award for catalyzing the advancement of minorities research. At the CDC, Dr. C was a senior health scientist in the division of HIV AIDS prevention. He was a member of the CDC SARS outbreak investigation team and led the CDC SARS community outreach team in Asian communities. His contribution and publications in the field of public health have led to numerous awards, including outstanding alumnus awards from his two other alma mater, Harvard School of Public Health and the Johns Hopkins University from where he received his master's and doctorate degrees in public health. 
So for his opening presentation, let us welcome Dr. Francisco C, who will dwell on critical lessons learned during this pandemic. Dr. Francis C. Okay, uh, I'll share my, my screen now. So part one, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, part one will deal with, uh, I'll start first with what we know about COVID-19 and then talk about lessons learned. And then part two will talk about the future of the pandemic. So if you remember, this, this is a picture during the plague years in medieval times. And in modern times, this is how it's supposed to look like with Ebola. Uh, and I think we have PPE that looks something like this. Um, I want to start with the uh, discussion on emerging disease. Why, um, how do you define emerging diseases? So this could be infections that have nearly appeared in the population, just like COVID-19. It's a uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus that occur in our population, or it could have existed before, but are rapidly increasing in incidence or in geographic areas. So uh, the Institute of Medicine convened an expert panel in 1992, and they identified six factors that cause emergence of diseases. And only one refers to the microbe, the microbial adaptations and change. The rest are mostly human, uh, effect for human behavior, economic development, land use, human demographics and behavior, and international travel and covers, change in technology, industry, and breakdown in public health measure. I highlighted the three factors that I think uh, are responsible for the emergence of COVID-19. In 2003, they reconvened another panel. Aside from these six uh, factors, they added uh, another six factors for causing emergence, including increased human susceptibility to infections, climate change, changing ecosystems, poverty and social inequality, which we're seeing now with COVID-19, war and famine, lack of political will, and intent to harm, because uh, some of this agent could be used as a biological uh, weapons. I think I should just uh, put it here, right? Another way to look at this convergence model, you can see that when uh, you learned before about agent host uh, interaction to the environment, but actually the environment is quite big. You can look at physical environment. You can look at ecological environment, social, political, economic factors, and genetic biological factors in the humans. And all of this could cause convergence and lead to emergence of diseases. So uh, coronavirus are very common viruses and uh, they cause very common mild, moderate respiratory, respiratory tract infections. And uh, there are four groups of coronaviruses, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And the one that we're concerned with today is the, de is the beta coronavirus. Actually, they are zoonotic infections. In other words, uh, they naturally infect animals and then uh, they could infect humans also, but they actually, that's why it's very hard to control them because the reservoir hosts are animals. So there are seven types of human coronaviruses uh, and uh, four are, co are causing less uh, mild respiratory illness, but the three that cause severe illness are MERS, SARS and COVID-19. So SARS coronavirus 2 or SARS CoV 2 is a novel coronavirus. It's a new uh, virus. Is it better this way? Can you see it better? Is it better showing you this way? The other view uh, is be better, the bigger one. I don't know. Is, is this better? The other one I think was better, it was bigger. At least for me, the single slide view. 
<laughs> okay, it's hard. It's okay. Me, Never mind. I can still see. So uh, with the SARS CoV two, you can see that um, you know it's very easy to transmit aeros aerosolized airborne transmission, also by touching uh, contaminated surfaces. And it's a call, called the coronavirus because of the spike protein around it, the orange spike protein, which the virus uses for attachment when they attach to the cells and invade the cells. And then you can see there's a lot of other proteins that you can see from, so this orange one are called S protein. And then there are other protein called uh, M protein, the purple one, and, the, and then the blue one, the M protein, but inside you can see the RNA. And uh, so they look like ray of the sun, so they're called corona, like a crown. So this is the life cycle. So they use those spike protein to attach to the cell. And once they attach to the cell, they invade the cells. And once they gain control of the cell, cell they, they use it as a factor to produce more, not more virus and, and infect other cells and, and spread it. So I want to compare SARS and COVID-19. They're both coronavirus, but the, the SARS that occurred in 2002 and three is called SARS coronavirus one. The one that caused COVID-19 is SARS CoV-2. And the host for the SARS in 2002, 2003 was uh, the reservoir hosts are bats. And from bats, it went to civet's cats. And then from civet's cats, it went to humans. It, with COVID-19, they think that it started with the bats and then from bats to pangolins and then to humans. Both of them originated from China. The one in SARS only spread to about 29 countries to about 8,000 cases and about 10% of, of them died. Compared to, uh, you can see that uh, with COVID-19, which started in Wuhan in December, 2019, it spread to about 191 countries. MERS uh, uh, is another uh, coronavirus. The host is bats and uh, dromedary cam camels. The origin is in Saudi Arabia. And it started in 2012, it's still going on now. So far it's spread to 27 countries, but most of them are in Saudi Arabia. But the other countries are affected because these are workers who work in Saudi Arabia, including the Philippines. And then when they return to the country, they were infected. Um, but has a very high mortality rate, 35%. If you compare SARS and COVID-19, you can see that with SARS, that's why it's easy to control those. It's mostly acute infections, and most of the cases were hospital uh, patients and transmission of hospital setting. Uh, compared to COVID-19, we have a high number of asymptomatic infections, and transmits mostly in the community. So it's harder to control. And uh, you can see that with SARS in 2003, within eight months, we're able to control the spread of SARS pandemic through in, uh, improvement infection control practices, use of PPE, testing, isolation, contact tracing, quarantine, the same um, public health measures are being used for COVID-19. With MERS, uh, similar to SARS, most of them are acute infections and there's no asymptomatic uh, MERS. And most of them occur in hospital setting. As I mentioned earlier, 80% of cases occurred in Saudi Arabia. There's no vaccine for it and there's no cure, cure for it. So this is the life cycle. You can see uh, the civet cuts from the bats, the civet cuts for humans causing the, uh, uh, no, th that's for SARS. And then for the MERS, it's affect the bats and then the camels. And then for COVID-19, they think that the intermediate host could be a pangolin. Actually pangolin uh, is derived from the word pangulong, which is a Malay word which means roller, I think it's, a, it's actually a Tagalog word. That means 
parang gulong because uh, the pangolin, when they're threatened, if you can look at the right picture, when they're threatened, they become like a ball and they will roll. So actually parang gulong. So this uh, pangolin actually is very uh, expensive because um, they're in traditional medicine in China and other parts of Asia, their scales are supposed to be um, uh, therapeutics and also their meat are also uh, very expensive. So they're, they're being used a lot in Asia in traditional medicine. So SARS-CoV-2 is very easy to acquire and very easy to spread. The reason for that is because 80% of infected people have mild symptoms and actually 50% have no symptoms at all. So these are asymptomatic carriers. About 50 to 20% will develop severe disease and need hospitalizations and 5% will develop life threatening and fatal outcomes. So it's easy come, easy go. It's still spreading. In the year and a half, you can see the spread to 191 countries. As of this morning, July 1, you can see 182 million cases in the world with three, almost 4 million deaths, 2.2% uh, case fatality compared to SARS 10%, MERS is 35%. So this is actually lower in, in case fatality. And you can see the number of cases in the US, 33 million, India, 30 million, Brazil, 18 million, Philippines, 1.4 million. Um, And so when we talk about transmission, you need to know the basic reproductive rate or R naught. So you can see that from one person, how, how many people can be spread to. And you can, from this slide here, you can see that for COVID-19 is from one person to two and two and a half. But right now with the new variant, it could be up to maybe five. If you look at MERS, from one person can go to 2.5 or 7.2. So SARS is from one person to two to four uh, people in terms of transmission. The other concern with um, both SARS and COVID-19 is uh, the super spreaders. And this is a very good example with SARS. Look at from one case here, how, how many people uh, became infected from one case and from another case that came from the first case, you can see how many more people got infected. These are called people who are super spreaders. And we don't know uh, what's the biology of these people that make them super spreaders, but most of them are asymptomatic carrier. And uh, there's a lot of super spreading events, but how do we prevent them? So testing contact tracing is very important isolation, and then ep epidemiologists like to talk about three Cs, like avoid crowded settings or closed spaces with poor ventilation and avoid close contact. With COVID-19 tests, there are two types of tests, the viral tests. The PCR is more sensitive um, because it look for the RNA. The antigen test is less sensitive and it's looking for the proteins, remember, we showed you the bars with a lot of proteins. Those are the type of proteins they're looking for, but the antigen test is uh, produce the results more quickly. Another way of testing do serology tests where you look for antibody to show if uh, the person had prior infection with the virus. So these are COVID-19 diagnoses that we have learned. Uh, that the RNA is more sensitive uh, than the, um, the antigen test. And then, but again, there's some false sensitivity. At the, there's some false positive tests or false negative tests that occur with the antigen test. Another thing that we learned about COVID-19 is occurrence of cytokine storm, which is really a perfect storm. And uh, it's actually a reaction to the body uh, when there's a when the virus entered the body and the immune system tried to attack it. So that's uncontrolled generalized immune response to the, to the antigen or the, to the virus. And then also we learn about with children, it can help 
all this inflammation that causes multi system inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, similar to the toxic shock syndrome or Kawasaki disease. And then treatment with COVID 19, very important infection prevention and control measures and supportive care and providing oxygen. And for the very, very sick, they, they may need the um, ventilation. So far, there's only one approved uh, drug called Rendesivir. And then, so th there's a lot of different uh, pharmacologic treatment available for patients with COVID-19 now. So you can take a look at the NIH website for that. S hospitalization six times higher uh, and 12 times higher for patients with comorbidities like heart disease, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. And more recent reports shows that it's not all the people getting it. You can see that uh, nowadays two out of three are younger people, you know, 25 to 44, and a lot of them are minorities. Like, like you know, I'm using uh, US data here. What's the current situation July 1 in the world? You can see here that this is in, this is India. You can see it went up and it, it started to go down. And this is the US here. And you can see other countries uh, here. Um, you can see it's still a ongoing pandemic. And if you look at the case fatality ratio, this, this is number of death over number of cases. Peru actually has a very high number, followed by Mexico and Afghanistan, you know. Um, Well, didn't go correct. So actually, the better way to do it is to look at death per hundred thousand population. So, Peru maybe uh, Peru is. Uh, you can see here the case fatality is nine point four. The number of death per hundred thousand population is five hundred ninety one point six, compared to the U.S. Our case fatality is one point eight percent and uh, death per 100,000 population, 184.23. Philippines, 1.7 case fatality, and uh, um, per 100,000 population, 22.8. China is very low because China have a large population. So you can see their death is 0.35 per 100,000 population. So in the past, we talk about strain. Now they talk more about variants, but Actually, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, mutation is very slow, but because of increased transmission, more strains, are, you can see more strains. Um, and nowadays, uh, we call them variant. And uh, today, WHO came up with uh, a listing. Uh, they started to, to rename them. Instead of the B.119, they decided that uh, we should classify the two groups, the variants of concern and variants of interest. These are the variants of concern. We need to say uh, this variants have increased in trans, could, in, could result in increase in transmission and also they could increase in their virulence or cause decrease effectiveness in our preventive measures. And the variants of concern now are the most common now is Delta. That's the Indian um, Indian variant. So Alpha is the UK variant, Beta is the South Africa variant, and Gamma is the Brazilian variant. And the first date here is the date it was documented, and the second date is the date of designation by WHO. And the next group are called the variants of interest. That means uh, uh, they could uh, cause transmission but they're not a big concern yet. And so you can see there's one from the US, one from Brazil, and also one from the Philippines called Teta variant, which, which uh, occurred in January, 2021. One thing about cases in the, in the US, Filipinos make up 4% of nurses in the US, but 31.5 of nurses but there, 31.5 uh, nurses dead are due to Filipinos too. So you can see that although there, there are fewer nurses of, from the Philippines, but there are more, more of them dying because they're in the front line. 
Another concern in the U.S. is increase in racism uh, uh, with Asian American uh, and discrimination and, uh, and also assault. You can see here verbal harassment, shunning, physical assault, civil rights violation, harassment. The more recent one in March or April was in Atlanta where uh, someone killed several uh, women in massage parlor. So as a result of that, Congress came up with the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. It was signed by the president on May 20, 2021. Uh, there are four types of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna are called messenger RNA vaccine. And so, and then the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are called vector vaccine. They contain a virus, um, like common cold virus as a vector where they can insert the genetic material of the virus. And then Novavax is a protein subunit and the Sinovac is a virus based vaccine is killed or weakened virus. So the one available in the US are called Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. I think the Philippines you have Sinovac and AstraZeneca and now you start to get Pfizer and Moderna too. So in the US, we started with priority groups in terms of um, vaccination and by, by phase also now because of increased supply of vaccine, it's everybody's not eligible to, to get a vaccine in the, in the US. And this is what we call the herd immunity and for SARS-CoV-2, it's about 70%, 70 to 85% is the, is the herd immunity so that means seven, at least 70 percent of populations will be fully vaccinated for herd immunity to occur. And we're not there yet. So this as of today, the vaccination by countries, you can see that the blue dots are those above average and then the yellow dot, I don't think show it, those are below world average. You can see that Israel is 57% of their population fully vaccinated, UK 49, US 47, China 15.9, and you can see Philippines only 2.4% uh, fully vaccinated. So there's really no magic bullet. There's no cure for, for COVID-19. We have effective vaccines, but of course uh, not all vaccines are the same. Some have higher um, efficacy like Pfizer, Moderna 95%, but the others may be lower. So effective vaccines are not available to all people in the whole world. So we still need to use a combination of intervention, testing, isolation, contact tracing, quarantine, infection control, wearing masks, social distancing. You can see countries like Taiwan, Vietnam, and New Zealand, they may have lower vaccination rate, but you can see that their mortality rate uh, is actually lower because they practice all these public health measures. So lessons learned, what was it? Okay, let's, let's go to lessons learned from COVID-19. I have 15 lessons. And the first lesson is public health mitigation measures work, especially wearing masks. The second lesson is the uh, med medical breakthrough when scientists work together. Like you can see within a year and a half, within a year, we're able to develop vaccines for COVID-19. And the lesson three is that vaccines are powerful tools for prevention as well as for improving disease outcomes. And also during the lockdown, we all learn how to become resilient as a community. And number five for us healthcare professionals, we learn to say, I don't know. That as, we, as we learn more about COVID-19, we try to learn more about it. But then when patients or friends ask us hard questions, I really will tell them, I don't know the answer. So, we learn how to be hum humble. So a, a, a dose of humility uh, is very important. Uh, also realize the importance of family. When you're isolated, you learn how to Zoom and contact everybody weekly or as frequently as you want. And you learn how to take care of yourself too. Self-care is important. Getting online for good, you learn how to get online and how to do Zoom. and. And also a lot of people start practicing telehealth, telemedicine. 
and we have to learn how to restore our trust to one another because when you're locked down, you really have to to depend on other people to deliver your your food or your uh, groceries. Uh, number eleven is we, we need to take care of our mental health. Isolation, loneliness really affect our health, and we learn about health disparities. People affected by this, the long line uh, in the community pantry. We need to prepare for the future and for future pandemic. And now we learn that we can work at home. You know, working anywhere uh, is happening now. But the mo most important lesson we learn is that power lies with the community. We, we change our behavior, we could uh, save lives. So community empowerment is very, very important. These are some uh, uh, lessons uh, from different uh, individuals. So Dr. Collins, the director of NI said that, well, the most important lesson he learned is that we can we can bring scientists together, then we can um, produce vaccines like this. Dr. Freedom, former city director said, communication is very, very important. And Bill Schaffner from Vanderbilt said, combination of both uh, science and public health response is very important. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Francis C. for the very extensive review of uh, SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. and then the comparisons with MERS and uh, SARS, the previous SARS. Also, thank you for those lessons. Um, if there are any questions, we will reserve the questions for the end. So we will go to our um, next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Mingita Padilla. Uh, Dr. Padilla is a clinical professor at the Department of Ophthalmology of UPPGH, where she also trained as a resident physician. She is the founder, current president, and CEO of the iBank Foundation of the Philippines. She recently became the president of the Association of iBanks in Asia. She also serves as a technical advisor for the DOH Philippine Organ Donation and Transplantation Program. Dr. Padilla is a consultant at the St. Luke's Medical Center Global City, where she is the head of the ocular tissue transplant service and also a member of the advisory board. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she became the lead medical advisor of the Office of the Presidential Advisor on Entrepreneurship for Project ARC, a private sector-led movement to make testing of SARS-CoV-2 accessible to all Filipinos. Uh, she's currently among a group of physicians working to overcome vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. She has authored and co-authored various publications ranging from scientific papers to social political commentaries. She is a staunch advocate of improving healthcare through good governance. She served as head of the executive staff of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation and actively lobbied for the passage of the Universal Healthcare Act. Dr. Padilla is a recipient of multiple awards and recognitions, both local and international for her pioneering work in eye banking, alleviation of blindness, community service, and curbing healthcare fraud. Let us welcome Dr. Mingita Padilla, who will talk on keeping the eye bank running in the time of COVID-19. Dr. Um. Padilla. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for that very generous introduction. Let me just share my slides, okay? Just give me a second to share my, share my slides. Uh -huh. Just a moment. I always have this problem. Can you see my slides now, my screen? There we go. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay, great. 
So my, my presentation is keeping the iBank running during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Philippine experience. First of all, I'd like to thank PASE for inviting me to this webinar. I am both honored and humbled by being included among this stellar group of uh, uh, speakers. I have no conflict of interest to declare in connection with this presentation. And I'd like to acknowledge the following for helping me with some of the photos uh, I'm going to show in this presentation. Um, First, before anything else, I know many of you don't know what the IBAC is all about. So it's a brief introduction. I'll give you a background of why we had to be uh, founded in the first place. No? The IBAC Foundation is a nonprofit, non-government humanitarian organization that is dedicated to the retrieval. This example is here, uh, processing here, storage and distribution of trans transplantable corneal tissue for transplant research and training. We are now located at the second floor of the Centro Ophthalmologico Jose Rizal at the Philippine General Hospital. We have been there since the year 2005. Prior to that, we were with the Makati Medical Center. And that's where we started in 1995. This is the cornea, a beautiful cornea, a clear cornea. And it is the first surface that light has to enter for us to be able to see. So this is a perfect cornea. Unfortunately, not everybody is as fortunate. Uh, in the Philippines and in the rest of the world, uh, corneal uh, disease is one of the most common or the top five reasons for visual impairment. A 2018 study of the Philippine IDC study uh, showed that it is number five among Filipinos. But this is just statistics. Nothing speaks louder than a picture. So a picture paints a thousand words. What are examples of corneal blindness? Um, you'll see a lot of pictures in my, in my talk, okay? Well, in the Philippines, you have, in the past, when we didn't have that much measles uh, vaccination, measles keratitis was one of the causes. We also have um, congenital, like this limbo, uh, this dermoid. Then we have cataract uh, extraction or cataract surgery. Complications after cataract surgery is rising as a reason for corneal transplants. Cataract surgery is one of the safest um, uh, surgical procedures and one of the best results yielding operations. However, it can also have complications, especially if your cornea is weak to start with. Then we have keratocomas. Now this is a uh, genetic abnormality, uh, usually starts manifesting in the second decade of life, but in your cone, uh, the cornea becomes shaped like a cone because of weakness in the stroma. Then you have your infections no? um, and then trauma. In the Philippines, the most common reasons why people need to have corneal transplants are trauma, infections, and complications following cataract surgery. Prior to the IBANC in 1994, such people as these had virtually no hope. We had to wait for charity, for charity from abroad, from tissue which did not really find a home in the US, or from tissue from Sri Lanka. Eyeballs at that time, whole eyeballs. Technology was very different. And the reason there was no hope was because we didn't have this corneal tissue, donor corneal tissue, which is so small. This is a tissue in Optisol. Uh, if you go from white, from the sclera to the sclera, because nowadays we get the entire, we don't just get the cornea, which is about 11 to 12 millimeters in diameter, we get a lot, about three millimeters of scleral tissue. No? This is the way we do it nowadays. It is so small. It is about 0.5 millimeters thick. It's like a fingernail, a large fingernail. And yet there was no corneal tissue, no systemic or systematic way to distribute tissue. And this was a major source of our being unable to help these people. Uh, corneal transplant is a transforming uh, procedure. No? Imagine going from this to this, not seeing to seeing. And for every blind person, you have at least six more people who are affected. So there's no doubt it was important or it is important. So what made it all possible for us to be able to open the IBAC, even if you had a foundation, we had to amend our law. Um, an act to amend or to advance coronal transplantation in the Philippines was passed in February 20, 1995, signed by uh, Fidel Ramos, President Fidel Ramos. No? We had to do this in order for even Tissue Banks International, based in Baltimore, Maryland, to even bother to help us. Uh, we had to amend our law so it would include a presumed consent patterned after Maryland 
for medical legal cases, unidentified, unaccompanied uh, cadavers in the possession of the police who are undergoing autopsy. And we had to also change the law so that IBAC technicians who were either RNs or um, uh, licensed medical techs trained in eye banking could now be allowed to harvest corneas and eyeballs. In many countries, it's still only the physician who can do that. And that's why they have no eye bank, okay? The IRR was completed July, 1995. And these were the ones who helped pass the law. And this is the one who signed it. It made possible the opening of our eye bank in October 16, 1995, one year and seven months after we were founded. Some people in this, uh, uh, in this uh, photograph have already passed on, Dr. Forrest, Raul Forrest, uh, Mr. Frederick Griffith was very instrumental in helping us from Tissue Banks International. Uh, Father David has also passed on. So this is a, a very precious picture for all of us. And it also made possible our cooperation with the Philippine National Police. We signed our first MOA in 1996. Now, and it was supposed to jumpstart the IBAC that you have all these medical legal cases uh, that we were able to retrieve corneas from, just corneas, not whole eyeballs, no? through the uh, Coroner's Act that we adopted. It was supposed to be a jump start, and we were supposed to encourage more and more hospitals to have retrieval programs. It was only later that we were able to really do this, no? because as you know, the Philippines has a lot of problems, and organ donation and tissue donation from cadaveric uh, donors is not a priority. So it was basically the private sector who was really pushing this through the NGO, which is the IBAN Foundation. Very important partners from the start were Philippine Airlines, Cebu Pacific, and LBC. Because we live in an island nation of over 7,000 islands, and much of the need is outside Metro Manila, outside Luzon. So we had these uh, airlines and couriers sign MOAs with us so that these tissue are distributed free of charge to all points where they go to in the Philippines. The relationship stays to this day, more than 25 years after, and we are very grateful to them. From 1995 to 2017, the flow of tissue was from Metro Manila out to the different points of the country through Philippine Airlines, Cebu Pacific, LBC, and then later on Victory Liner. But Later on, uh, as of March 13, 2020, we were able to open several uh, retrieval centers outside Metro Manila. And some of them are really, really uh, very successful. Baguio General Hospital uh, was very successful. No? And we were planning to open more, okay? This was before the COVID pandemic struck. And this was, this was the list of partners, funeral homes, hospitals, where we were, where we were doing our retrieval prior to the lockdown in March, 2016. What happened after? We lost everything except the PNP morgues in the national capital region. So we were back to where we started, our loyal partners. No? Because what happened, no? as all of us know, and you saw in the earlier lecture, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us in so many ways. And in fact, many eye banks had to close. No? Uh, as of June 30, there were 181 million already confirmed cases, uh, more than almost 4 million deaths, okay? And so far, only around um, 2 billion vaccine doses administered. So it's still affecting all of us. It isn't over, especially with the advent of the Delta variant. No? So what happened to us? No? On March 16, we had the lockdown, the entire Luzon. Uh, it's a very strict lockdown. March 20, the Philippine General Hospital, where we are located, was uh, designated as a COVID-19 referral hospital. And life, our life changed. Virtually all non-COVID admissions ceased. Only urgent, emergent, life-threatening admissions were allowed other than COVID-19. Everyone, regardless of specialty, had to learn all things COVID-19, including the Department of Ophthalmology, the younger ones, we were, we were organized like an army, like a military uh, army. No? Younger ones were the frontliners and the more senior ones were reservists. No? So these are ophthalmology residents on duty in the COVID ward. 
So we had to learn all things COVID. Even the residents had to forget ophthalmology first and learn COVID. I kept seeing, and we, the older ones, were reservists. It was really like that. No? I kept seeing our private patients in another hospital in St. Luke's, but even there, no elective surgeries were performed because it was also a COVID referral center. The Philippine General Hospital remains a main COVID referral center to this day. So what happened then? Our five-story uh, eye center became uh, a dormitory for healthcare workers who had to go on two-week rotations, okay? The eye bank shut down from March 16 to June 14, 2020, and our foundation became a means to raise for the COVID-19 pandemic battle in the We were also having things as mundane as that, even washing machines for the dormitory for the healthcare workers. You name it, uh, it was happening. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me, okay? You can, you can interrupt, okay? Because it says my internet connection is a little unstable. But we were able to resume for the team. The Centro of Salmonoico Hacerizal opened again and started seeing about 20% of its patient load. We have remained open today despite the surges and despite the continuing struggle with COVID-19. This talk briefly describes how our IBAN became operational through the COVID-19 pandemic, despite how many other had to close. This is an example of our IBAN technician in a morgue in the National Police District, uh, North Northern, and this is our badge in her PP level three. To the, this is there's a metaphor madness. The key is balance of safety and livelihood. We did not salaries, although there were some workers who who, who resigned for many reasons. One of them safety. Um, because costs on non-essential items. And one of the lessons learned as uh, told by Dr. C was that we could do things differently. We didn't need to travel all the time. We had our virtual things and this helped us save money. Okay? But from home during the lockdown, we still responded and we still needed transplants. Uh, it was good that we still had our stock of tectonic and tissue, not enough for optical, but good enough to save an eye. And our skeletal force went on alternating work uh, uh, once we resumed operations on June 15. Our people must have halfway for delivery around those gate. Okay, the way we came from Baguio, the journalists in Baguio, we met them somewhere in Tarlac. So we found ways as uh, the BDO added, we found ways. We had to balance it and live with the So we had to monitor or modify our dietary with three cohorts on coronary donations, COVID 19 at the time of death, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome at the time of death, history of presence of any signs, symptoms of him at the time of death, all contraindications for even considering them a coronary donor. Now, all eye banks agree on the following. There should be careful history, taking, taking, not done, to exclude all donors who passed away from COVID-19 or who have shown signs of COVID-19 at the time of death. It is necessary and is key in ensuring safety of tissue for transplantation. So these are agreed upon. And we will talk about this first because the controversial one where there are differing ideas are on whether you need to swab a cadaveric donor for COVID at the time before uh, retrieving tissue, okay? So let's go first to COVID on IDA. Uh, studies have paper no? uh, that there, the surface of the conjunctive with ACE, ACE2 receptors. We also have the furin protein. And um, we know that the viral spike proteins attached to the host's uh, ACEs. And fury protein promotes the priming of the S subunit of the spike protein in S1, which is related to the binding of the ACE receptor. 
and S2, which is related to the fusion of the virus lipid membrane with the cell membrane. In Italy in 2020, Colvita and Associates found the first positive sample of PCR in a conjunctival stool in a patient diagnosed with COVID-19 who presented with bilateral follicular conjunctivitis. And interestingly, PCR from conjunctival samples showed positive results until 21 days after the symptoms started, and even when the nasopharyngeal swabs were negative. So it is present. No? Then more evidence of the presence of SARS-CoV-2 virus in the eye came out. One of them was from Dr. Azzolini and associates, also in Italy, where in 52 of 21 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 had SARS-CoV-2 virus in their conjunctiva via RT-PCR. And some patients with positive conjunctival swabs had negative nasopharyngeal swabs. We recently also called the where we found that, uh, and this is an indirect uh, evidence uh, that it does affect the eye, it may be really present in the eye. One third of those patients admitted for COVID-19 moderate to severe cases in PGH had a uh, virus degree of conjunctive this. Interestingly enough, these are two examples. Now, interesting, interestingly enough, some of the symptoms of the eye preceded their symptoms. So it can be the presenting symptoms. We haven't done this yet. We're still working on that. Now, fortunately, we have a lot of S2 receptors in the conjunctiva and core. The tears also fences itself to uh, the two major ones, one uh, I just found that uh, you know with the host space to receptors, it also prevents the virus from entering the human cells. And also very important, we have lactoferin, no? an anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antiviral. In a very um in a small but very uh, relevant studies recently published, post-mortem eyes from 33 donors who were not eligible for transplant were studied. 13% okay? prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 was seen in tissues of those whose eyes were not clean with povidone iodine prior to their being tested. It was not performed. Yet, there was less pro prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the anterior cornea than in the posterior cornea and likely due, the postulate was likely due to lactoferin in the tear film that may prevent binding of SARS-CoV-2 to the AC, ACE receptors on the surface of the eye. But very important to us eye bankers was that swabs obtained from eyes in which povidone iodine disinfection was performed as part of the procurement protocol were negative for SARS-CoV-2. And this makes us very happy. Now this confirms an earlier published study we're in in vitro, which is an in vitro study that showed that all, um, all tested povidone iodine products with different concentrations from 10%, 7.5%, 1%, to even the 0.45% throat spray showed uh, a 99.99% kill rate with a contact time of only 30 seconds for SARS-CoV-2. So our lowly povidone iodine does work. This was in vitro and even in eyes post-mortem um, that were not uh, used for corneal donation because they had COVID-19 at time of death. This is very good for us because our IBAC since 2014, we have employed a double povidone, povidone iodine irrigation uh, procedure for our PrEP. We got this from India. We are so obsy with povidone iodine. Why? Because like, like India, the Philippines is a tropical country and we are more prone to fungal infections and povidone iodine gives us some protection against fungus. The, all the um, preservation media for eye banks for the cornea do not contain any antifungal, only antibacterial. So what do we do? We use 5% povidone iodine swab of our superior and inferior fornices and lids and lid margins. Then we do a povidone povidone iodine irrigation, 5% of the superior and inferior cul-de-sacs that's in the, inside the lids, no? leaving 0.75 cc of povidone iodine in place for five minutes before rinsing. Not just 30 seconds, but five minutes before rinsing. And while waiting for this, 
we again do a skin prep with 5% povidone iodine before we rinse out the ones we left behind. And finally, we do five drops of 2.5% povidone iodine in the upper portion of the eye, cul-de-sac, and in the lower portion, the lower cul-de-sac, just before we retrieve the tissue. And we leave it in place throughout the procedure. It is not toxic to the eye. So we are really obsessive compulsive about our povidone iodine. Hence, even during the time of COVID, we did not have to amend our procedure. So perfect. So there is no question about history, contraindications, and povidone, povidone iodine prep. But do we still need to do a nasopharyngeal swab of cadaveric donors? And if so, what kind of test is best? The answer is a mixed bag. There is still no consensus. Italy, right now, they are requiring uh, a PCR swabs on all post-mortem donors, even after doing a thorough screening. But even they, even those who are running the biggest eye banks in Italy, believe it is more procedural rather than based on scientific evidence. But like all clinicians know, sometimes we do things not because it's really scientific, but because it helps us sleep better at night. You know, many eye surgeons will say yes. Dr. Diego Ponzi, director of the Veneto Eye Bank, you know, the biggest eye bank in Italy, said he did a study using 2,326 RI back. They had 5% of the 2,326 swabs. But on further analysis, only four out of the six from the 35 donors who had positive nasopharyngeal swabs had actual SARS-CoV-2 RNA present in the cornea. And none of them had the characteristics of infectious virus. So these were all non-infectious traces of the virus. So he said, it's like I could leave my fingerprints, my fingerprints are left behind, but I'm no longer in the room. So he believes that we have convincing and even positive corneas, which are very few, by the way, even in positive COVID-19 patients, are unlikely to transmit the virus to recipients. Yet they do it as a procedural requirement. In the United States, federal regulations do not require postmortem to screen asymptomatic cell and tissue donors. These are cell donors. But the EBA guidelines indicate that a suspicious donor is deferred. In New York, however, only those who fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner due to suspicious or unusual deaths are tested postmortem. We do. We added NASA swap, SARS-CoV-2 antigen tests to the retrieval protocol. So even if it's really required by most, by even the EBAA, we decided to do this. No? As soon as it was endorsed and approved by the Philippine FDA in 2020, it is again procedural. Because like HIV testing of the donor cornea, we do. We do, I mean, of the, of the donor serum. Even if history has shown no documentation, uh, we still do this. Now there are famous. There's a famous uh, uh, case, no, or published cases wherein accidentally HIV-positive donors became multi-multi-organ multi donors. All of those who got their organs converted to HIV-positive, but those who got their corneas did not. So again, however, we still always do HIV testing of the serum procedural. Why are we doing antigen nasopharyngeal swab and not PCR? Well, based on the findings also of uh, Italian, Italian eye bags, no? uh, it can actually cause wastage of tissue and it can cause confusion. But we still wanted to do a swab. Well, um, the antigen testing is much less expensive than RT-PCR. Results are in in 15 minutes, so it can be done at the start of the site of the treatment. And there are studies, and we have been following them, that show that antigen testing has a higher correlation with the viability of the virus and infectiousness of the host compared to RT-PCR, which is so sensitive that you can get fragments of the virus and show it is positive, and you have false positives even when the patient is already no longer infectious. Uh, and I'm referring to this particular study, which was published as a major article 
uh, in the clinical infectious diseases. No? And the conclusion of the study was that the correlation between SARS-CoV-2 antigen and SARS-CoV-2 culture positivity represents a significant advancement in determining the risk for potential transmissibility beyond that which can be achieved by detection of SARS-CoV-2 genomic RNA. And important to IBANC is that SARS-CoV-2 antigen can facilitate low cost, scalable, and rapid time to result while providing good risk determination of those who are likely harboring infectious virus compared to RT-PCR. So again, we are doing this as an add-on, although not really required. Doing this to be able to sleep at night. Also, we're also doing this for our patients because they want, they feel better when they know that the IBAC is doing more than necessary, okay? And uh, it's also good for our surgeons. Now, since June 2020 to May uh, 2021, we have processed 465 corneas. This is about one third to one half of the number pre-pandemic. 43 were not suitable for transplant, but not because of COVID. They were not suitable because of HIV, syphilis, and uh, hep C. We are now serving only 39 surgeons in the Philippines out of the 73 corneal surgeons prior to COVID-19. And we are also sharing in Asia to prevent wastage. We are able to do this because our laws allow us to do this with legitimate IBACs in Asia. So far, since June 15 to today, uh, July 1, there have been no reports of any post-operative COVID in any of the recipients within a month of surgery. It's hard to control what happens after, especially when they're going out, but so far, uh, in our adverse reports, uh, adverse reaction reports, none of the surgeons have reported any COVID-19, no clinical COVID-19. Now, now, aside from this, what we do for our donors, we're also taking care of our employees. We, are, we were having nasopharyngeal swab antigen testing every two weeks for all IBAC staff. And we went a step further. We were even swabbing the medical legal officers and morgue attendants of the funeral homes where we were retrieving tissue. Now, two weeks after being vaccinated fully, uh, we are still swabbing our staff every month. So again, it may not be necessary, but we're doing it because it helps our staff uh, feel better. It helps our surgeons also feel safer. And it also helps our, surge, our patients feel better and more confident. Uh, this is a graph of um, cases in the Philippines. So far, we are better now than we were in March and April. Uh, I can hear a uh, hissing sound. We are better now than we were in March and April, but we are not up especially because of the Delta variant. Uh, I can hear somebody else's computer. Huh? We are now vaccinating only 214,912 doses daily. And so far only, uh, as of June 28, our local est our Reuters estimate says only 4.8% of the population has been vaccinated. We need to ramp up our vaccinations more. This is me, March 1, day one of the vaccination at PGH. So I was very, very happy. And we are grateful that we were able to be vaccinated. No? All 16 st current staff members of the VAEBAC have been fully vaccinated. The IBANC and its staff continue to trudge along to serve our surgeons and patients. Now, July 1, we are starting to awaken again, or reawaken, reawaken the hospital retrieval programs that had to stop because of COVID. Um, we could have our PNP morgues, but now the Cebu uh, retrieval program is starting. The Makati Medical Center has decided to revive our MOA with them. St. Luke's Medical Center is revisiting our uh, retrieval programs just for corneas and eyeballs. The Baguio General Hospital, which was one of our star, our star member retrieval centers, said they're going to jumpstart their retrieval program today, and I hope it happens. Eastern Visayas is hoping to restart uh, or try to start their program. In the meantime, we are also forging new partnerships. Manila has signed through their mayor, a very important MOA with the IBAC just recently, wherein their six major hospitals will now have an active coronal retrieval program. And the mayor, uh, Moreno, signed a donor card. To us, this is very important. And Asian Hospital also has revived 
their um, um, hospital retrieval program. So we are very grateful for these new partnerships we are forging. Now, our prayer is for us to be protected throughout this pandemic and for the Lord to allow us to continue to fulfill our mission. After pandemic, we may emerge, we hope we may emerge better, stronger, more beautiful to our creator's eyes so that we may serve more people and serve them better. Finally, I'd like to end with an appeal for everyone to consider a cornea and eye donation, be a hero in someone's eyes. Click this link, www.ibankfail.org, that's our iBank website, and you can do slash E underscore pledge, and we have an electronic pledge form. Anyone can pledge to become an eye donor or cornea donor. Thank you very much, and thank you from the iBank staff. That's the end of my lecture. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. Um, that was certainly eye-opening, you know, <laughs> a frontliner and an administrator trying to run something against all odds. That's really commendable. Now, we have a comment. I know it's Dr. Eric Domingo's turn, but we have a comment about the povidone um, iodine, yeah. you yes. know, that prophylaxis against COVID-19. So they, um, some of our participants, you know, Yes. showing that it's effective treatment. It's really, that's why this, yeah, the nice thing, the, the newly published uh, papers really show that when you do povidone iodine prep, it really destroys the SARS-CoV on the surface. Just FYI, before I go, because I have a clinic in the state uh, even those who have negative swabs, and um, aside from that, uh, we always all put with an iron box. Thank you so much. And thank you for the comment, Joey. Thank you again, Dr. Padilla. So our next speaker is Dr. Rolando Eric Domingo. Well, he is known to everyone in the Philippines because he is the Director General of the Philippine Food and Drug Administration. He is also a tenured professor of ophthalmology at the University of the Philippines, Manila, where he finished his residency training. Please note that he has a Diploma Superior in International Public Health from the Escuela Nacional de Sanidad in Madrid. So he is a public health uh, specialist at heart. He has been appointed in many branches in the Philippine government. He was a former assistant secretary at the Department of Health and director of the Philippine General Hospital. He was also elected a city councilor of Pampanga where he served to promote health education and a smoking ban. He is a published researcher and an awarded teacher. Recently, he was recognized by the World Health Organization on his accomplishment in the area of tobacco control. He worked in communities as the country coordinator for the Philippines under the World Health Organization Prevention of Blindness in Children project. He is a believer of progressive public health and works with integrity and professionalism while engaged in his various roles as a clinician, government official, researcher, and professor. Therefore, he has all the views of the frontliner, the policymaker, the implementer, he is everything rolled into one. Please welcome Dr. Eric Domingo, who will present the regulatory response of the Philippine FDA to COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Yasmin. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Paase for this invitation. And, uh, and you know exactly who to, who to make me come here. <laughs> there are very few people I can say no to. <laughs> and Tita Yasmin is one of those. No? She's my boss and colleague uh, in, uh, in ophthalmology. In, uh, we're ocular pathologists together. And we work with a lot of things together. I can never say no to Yasmin. No? But I'm very happy to be here today. Because it, it's such a wide range of topics that we have. No? We have uh, the clinical concerns and then a public health service affected by the uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the IBAC and the transplant program. Talagang lahat tayo nagkanda windang-windang, as we say here in the Philippines, so that's a COVID, everything has been thrown off. 
And one other thing that uh, I'm going to share with you now is actually the regulatory response no, to this uh, pandemic. Uh, we all know what the government is doing, how they're rolling out vaccinations, you know, the hospital system, how they're coping. But there are times sidelines the behind the scenes. It's not, and that is the regulatory function no, of government when it comes to health products. And that will be FDA. And I'm glad that uh, you're giving me some time to share with you, uh, no, no, to share with you today. And uh, so this is uh, no, no, the Philippine FDA regulatory response to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the, the law that, uh, that the, word, the FDA is working under and the several laws attached to that also always presupposes that we are under normal conditions. No? Hindi tayo ready na magkaroon ng, ano, ng epidemic. Very few flexibilities in the law. And it's always, ano, this is what you do, this is how you register a, a company, how you register a product. Pero walang nakalagay doon na in case of a pandemic no, or in case of a public health emergency, then you have a mechanism A or mechanism B. And I actually was appointed to the FDA right, ano, like a few weeks no, at the start of the first few cases of COVID-19 detected in China and then the first case in the Philippines. So yung nakalagay natin na regulatory framework natin, including you know, the way everything works and everything is structured in FDA, is as if everything is uh, under regular circumstances. And it was very difficult at the start for us to respond quickly no, to, the, to the emerging situation. And we had to, to really work and make sure that we were able to respond no, and continue responding to the pandemic. Now, the FDA has about less than a thousand no, uh, employees in the workforce all over the country. And we actually do a lot of things. Number one, we issue licenses to operate for manufacturers, traders, distributors, importers, even mga butika and radiation facilities no, like x-ray clinics. Lahat yan, binibigyan ng license to operate ng FDA. So lahat ng related sa food, sa drugs, sa cosmetics, sa toys, sa mga pesticides, household hazardous substances, and radiation facilities are under the jurisdiction of the FDA. So aside from licenses, we also grant certificates of product registration no? or product notification for drugs, food and food supplements, all medical devices, mga household and urban pesticides and chemicals, cosmetics, ito nga, no? And recently, nadagdag sa atin, aside from toys and child care articles, would be the nicotine delivery systems. Ito mga vape, uh, which we know have to be regulated closely, no? Uh, yung mga vape, yung mga, mga electronic cigarettes, under FDA na rin yan. So once we grant a license to operate, and, or we grant a certificate of project, uh, product registration, we also have to do then now post-marketing surveillance to make sure that everybody follows, no? that your good manufacturing practice doesn't change, that you don't deviate from it. Every now and then, you have to be inspected. We go around the markets checking for products. Kaya makikita nyo, ang dami rin namin dinalabas no? ng mga advisories pag nakahuli kami ng mga unregistered product. And of course, yung mga sikat dyan, yung mga nahuhuli. For example, Rino, si Rino na liver spread na Nung chinect namin, hindi pala sila registered no, sa FDA. And then, think, you know what? These legitimate businessmen will follow the, re the regulations and then will ano naman, susunod naman sila at gagawin din nila lahat. Pero kung hindi talaga legitimate yan, kinakasukan namin yan. Because the FDA also has quasi-police powers. No? Pwede namin sila kasukan, lalo na kung high-risk products. So we inspect establishments and of course the pharmacovigilance. So in cases of drugs, for example, we have a drug adverse report, adverse event reporting system. And now that we're doing using vaccines no? under EUA, we have a very active adverse events following immunization uh, surveillance system that is in place. So after namin ma-register, binabantayan pa rin namin. Now, when the epidemic started, no? We suddenly had this surge of things that we had to do and we had to process, and we really had to make our regulatory system more, uh, you know, more responsive, quicker. Number one, shorten the times of anon at the time of processing, 
And then, of course, make it easier you know, for people to have access to services, including pati nga yung clinical trials natin. No? Before, two, two years ago, wala nang gusto mag-clinical trials sa Pilipinas. <laughs> Alam naman natin yan. I'm sure we have sila, Dr. Uh, Giselle and John Concepcion, mga tiga DOST. Hirap na hirap silang mag-clinical trials sa Pilipinas. Nung tinignan ko yung, pro, yung proseso, it took about six months to have a clinical trial approved no, with the FDA and the manufacturing drug manufacturing companies were going to our neighboring countries. No? So pag pupunta sa atin, lima, anim sa isang taon. So we took a look at it and then we had to streamline it. And now we're able to process uh, clinical trial applications within maybe three to four weeks. Kaya biglang dumami. No? Right now, for clinical trials for uh, COVID-19 related medicines, I think we have 25 ongoing. So it gives our scientists no, a lot of leeway. We have so many scientists now working on clinical trials for different uh, uh, mga modalities for treatment. Kasama dyan, may herbal products, merong blood products, merong the new monoclonal antibodies. And then we have four vaccine trials ongoing in the country. Pagkatapos doon, the next problem that we suddenly had was drugs were suddenly running out. If you remember, at the start of the pandemic, there was this big uh, hula baloo no, about hydroxychloroquine. Everybody said that it, was, ano, no, it, it, it could be used against COVID-19. Ang hydroxychloroquine, konti na lang ang registered product sa Pilipinas niyan kasi ang baba na ng demand. However, it was being used by patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and a few cases of malaria. Nung mauso ang balita ng hydroxychloroquine, including, of course, uh, Donald Trump at that time saying that it was the magic cure, everybody was buying hydroxychloroquine from the pharmacies. Sinulatan kami ng mga rheumatoid arthritis patients, they were running out of medicines for their maintenance medicine. So yung actual na indication na nangangailangan, wala silang mabili na gamot. No? Include, pag ganyan din nangyari sa tocilizumab, for example, which was used by children with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So the people who actually needed the medicines were being boxed out, pero nagagamit kasi no, ng mga pasyente for other purposes. So we have to come up with a quicker way of uh, registering products with that we already are registered in the country. No? Ang mukha nga ng hydroxychloroquine. Alam naman na natin yung profile niyan. Alam na natin yung safety profile niyan. Yung kanyang approved indications and the dosaging. No? So we made it easier and we came up with a path pathway which we call the drugs for emergency use. So nung time na yon, mas nabilawasan natin, hinati natin yung required na documents. Kasi mga registered naman na dito yan eh mayroon lang magdadagdag na ibang mag import or magpapasok or magpamanufacture. But of course, by nung natanggal, for example, yung hydroxychloroquine, tinanggal na ng mga infectious disease specialists yan sa listahan ng pwedeng gamitin for, ano, ng recommended na gamitin for COVID, we stopped it also. So hindi na rin sila pwedeng kumpa no, nung path na yun ng DEU. So it's very, ano, it's very, uh, re uh, we react naman to what is happening and the data that is around us. And then, of course, the more important, probably, the biggest change was the emergency use authorization. Because unlike a drug for emergency use, which is an already a known and registered drug, ang EUA ito talaga first in the history of our country and in the history of many countries that an emergency use authorization is given to a product that is still under development. And that would be particularly the COVID-19 vaccines. These are products that are not registered anywhere in the world. In fact, if you look at the product information of your vaccine, alibawa na pabakuna ka ng Pfizer or AstraZeneca or Moderna, first few paragraphs na kalagay doon, this is not an approved vaccine. Because it is not approved by the US FDA, it is not approved by the Philippine FDA, but we give emergency use authorization. We authorize it for use under the emergency ano, uh, pandemic right now by the government to use in an immunization program. And since we had no laws that allowed the use of a drug that is not yet completely developed, we had to ask for an, an executive order from the president granting the FDA the authority, the director general the authority to allow a use of a product that is still under development and I to create a completely new mechanism for that. No? So mas maikse, mas konti ang requirements, I had to create my expert panels both for vaccines and then for the technical side of the for vaccine quality and manufacturing. 
and then we do that all within 21 days no pag kumpleto yung sinasubmit ng product ng ano ng kumpanya so yung EUA ito talaga yung bagong bago Aside from that, we also expanded yung compassionate special permit. Actually, has been allowed since the time of ano, the time of Secretary Flavier. Na una yan, kasi doon nagkaroon na start magkaroon ng HIV. So, ang initial na laga na, na uh, gustong gawin ng CSB is that patients with life-threatening diseases like HIV and cancer, if there are products that are available in other countries, no? na halimbawa, nasa US siya, tapos registered siya doon. Kaya lang yung mga company hindi pumupunta sa Pilipinas. Kasi maliit lang yung market or hindi... It's not economically feasible no, to register and sell their products here. So if a product is registered in another country and it's not registered here and a patient needs it, the patient, the doctor, the hospital or the specialty society can ask for a special permit to import that product that is registered in another country and bring it here and use it on that patient. Nung panahon na ngayon ng COVID-19, we realized the compassionate special permit did not cover uh, infectious disease. No? Talagang very strict siya dati, HIV, cancer. So we had to expand it. We created an uh, administrative order and had it issued by the Department of Health to expand CSP, number one, to emerging infectious diseases and pandemic, ano, no, pandemic illnesses like COVID-19, for example. But there was another extension that we we ano, we asked for. So mahirap kasi wala pa namang masyadong gamot na talagang registered for COVID-19. A lot of them are still ano no, under investigation. So aside from including infectious disease, we included medicines that are being ano undergoing clinical trial right now para may expanded tayo na access to clinical trial drugs. So kahit na under clinical trial pa siya sa ibang bansa, pwede siyang hinga ng compassionate special permit dito sa atin kasi wala pa naman talagang COVID-19 registered product. No? So we allow that also. And that has allowed our patients to access a lot of the medicines that are out there in other countries that are not registered here or that do not have clinical trials here. And then of course, pag yung CPR, registration of pharmaceutical products, if it's a COVID-19 related product, we have, ano, we have a separate lane for that. Mas mabilis yan. Hindi siya pipila doon sa paracetamol, sa amoxicillin na ang dami-dami ng produktong available tapos nagre-register pa ng mga bagong brands. If it's a COVID-related, 19-related product, whether it's a diagnostic kit, whether it's a medical uh, equipment, gabot, lahat yan, or any other commodity, nakahiwala yan per center. And of course, we had to fast-track donations. We had to make sure that donations were released from customs talagang on the same day. Kasi at the start, we were really reliant on, ano, the country was relying on donations of PPEs, kung naalala nyo, kaubusan ng mask ng time, ng mga uh, personal protective equipment, and we were relying a lot on donations. And we had to make sure that these donations did not go, uh, they were not delayed sa paglabas sa customs at mailabas agad yan. Basta donations talaga for COVID-19. So, we the initial ano the the, the the really big uh challenge was that there were so many new technologies coming in no and hindi naman ready ang mga regulatory agency katulad natin for example when the covid-19 test kits were suddenly coming out pero una antibody test to naalala niyo tapos the antigen test tapos the and then the rt pcr kits there were very few laboratories in the country that could validate these kits in fact, at the start, only RITM was doing RT-PCR testing in the Philippines. But these kids were coming in and our reference labs were not ready to check and validate them. So at initially, at the start, we really had to rely upon more mature and stringent regulatory authorities like US FDA, for example, Japan, PMDA, the FDA of Japan, or Singapore. So pag mga stringent regulatory authority ni register yung product, pinapayagan na rin namin yan. Binibigyan na rin namin yan ng certification. And then, of course, as RITM, our reference lab, was able to develop its capacity to validate these kits. Ngayon, nire-require din natin ang validation. Pero nung start, we had to let them in, we had to use them, subject to validation of RITM before the government used the PCR, especially the RT-PCR kits. The PPEs, 
we have to make it uh, easy to ano, facilitate the entry of imported ones and manufacturing. So with BOST, we did a lot of work on this, also in encouraging our local manufacturers. So yung mga ibang manufacturer natin ng mga damit dati, no? siyempre biglang nawala ang negosyo ng damit. Transition sila into uh, manufacturing PPEs, mga gowns, coveralls, uh, mga, glove, mga iba gloves, at saka yung caps. And we help them through that no, technically at saka bigyan na, para mabigyan din sila ng license to operate and register their products and have them tested. Hanggang umabot sa ventilators and respirators, no, which our local scientists sa UP, NIH, at saka sa DOST, are working on. So, yung mga engineers natin, tsaka yung engineers ng ibang government agencies, are working together to make sure, of course, that we develop safe and, ano, no, and effective medical equipment. And then, yung naging isang malaking talagang challenge sa amin nun, yung alcohol. The, uh, alcohol it, it, it sounds maybe so trivial now and funny, but if you, if you remember, if like March, April last year, Everybody was panicking. They could not find any. Ano, no, they could not find any alcohol disinfectants. So 7-Eleven binabawal bumili ng more than two bottles. <laughs> Kung naalala nyo, no? kasi parang nagka-rationing. Ano? And that was because we were only manufacturing enough for regular use. And then everybody started needing it, cleaning offices. Uh, as of course, advised by DOH and the WHO. So biglang nagkaubusan ngayon. So we had to come up with a separate uh, policy for that to allow yung mga manufacturers to shift the transition into making alcohol for disinfectants. Ang karamihan, nagkaroon kasi ng alcohol ban sa mga pag-inom ng alak. So yung malalaking companies like Ginebra San Miguel, like yung mga Limtuaco, they shifted some of their manufacturing from alcohol beverages to sanitizing alcohol. And we, ano, we helped them transition and license their factories and tested the products to make sure that they conform with our standards. So kaya biglang after a few months, the bola, hindi, na, hindi tumagal yung shortage na yan. Hindi tayo naubusan ng alcohol. After a few months, we were able to uh, help these ano, this new companies, yung mga sugar manufacturing sa Bacolod, meron ganyan, tinerment nila, ginawa nilang alcohol. Ang DOST, maraming na support yan ng mga universities na mag-develop din ng alcohol sanitizers. And we, what we did during this time was really try to make everything, ano, no, put everything online, make everything electronic. Kasi biglang no face-to-face -face contact. Ano, we asked, as Mingita said, no, biglang nagsara lahat. Bawal ang tao pumasok. Bawal ang nagkaradalo na nung ECQ. People could not go to offices. But we could not stop working. No, we had to accept applications. We had to prop process them and we had to release uh, approvals. No? So ang FDA, para kami hospital, kahit hindi kami health facility, hindi kami pwedeng magsara. So lahat ng ibang offices nagsasara, pero kami, we just shifted a lot of our activities electronically and uh, you can send all of your registrations, all of the documents electronically. Half of our workforce, at least half, has always been working from home. Nagsishifting kami para hindi masikip. And then at the same time, para hindi mabawasan, hindi humaba yung processing time. Actually, dapat umikli. And it actually, ano, it actually shortened a lot of our processes. No? Na-realize natin na talagang the electronic uh, system works. No? Because the, 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 uh, it, it's just a lot quicker no? pag-transmit pag ng mga documents. So we also came up with our FDA verification portal kasi dami rin tao na nagbiglang maglalabasan. Pag panahon ng epidemia, panahon ng crisis, panahon din siya ng eh, opportunity for a lot of good and bad people. No? So, ang dami rin, if you open your online shopping, ang daming nagbibenta ng kung ano-anong gamot, kung ano-anong sanitizer, kung ano-anong test kit, which are, ano, no? which are not all of them are registered or can be sold online. So people were always asking us, no, if this test kit is for sale, is this a registered? So we came up with our FDA verification portal just so people can be served. Every time they have a question, they just can type it in whether it's a drug, food, or it's a medical device. And then makikita nila kung registered product yan para naman alam nila. Our COVID-19 vaccines with uh, emergency use authorization uh, to be very, very transparent about everything because these are products that are still under development not towards in the middle or towards the end of phase 3 clinical trials. And allowing their use means that we have the responsibility 
also to inform the public completely about the process they went through, the authorization it is given, and the adverse events that are being reported. So we have, if you click on the FDA website, there's one spot there that says updates on vaccines. So nakapost lahat doon yung EUA mismo. No? The emergency use authorization given for every vaccine. There's a link to the product information, the possible uh, risks, the possible adverse events that you might experience and what to do after. Plus, we also have a weekly reporting of all adverse events. No? So, summarize no? na kung ano na yung mga adverse events na nakikita natin. Kailangan pinifeedback natin yan completely, no? not in regularly sa ating public para alam nila kung ano yung nangyayari doon sa vaccine na binibigay natin sa kanila. And of course, our public health advisories are still there regularly. I think we lost Dr. Domingo somewhere. Richmond, can you help Dr. Domingo? I don't see him. Uh, yes, me and Richmond yeah. is gone. Ah, okay. Okay, because so, uh, he was dropped. I think uh, Eric has Not to uh, re enter. Yeah. Maybe you could viber him. Yes, I will try because he's lost. Yes. Maybe Giselle, we can go on with the next speaker. What do you think? You should go on to the next speaker, Andrew. Yes. yes. And, and when Dr. Domingo answers my phone, I tried to call him. So we will, um, well, that was a very, very interesting talk by Dr. Domingo. Everyone should hear how how everything has been fast tracked by this FDA. I know, you know, working with the Philippine FDA is a nightmare, but now, you know, with with this new implementing poly, you know, implementing rules and um, fast tracking all the methods. So I think that will be good for everyone. So our next speaker is Dr. Ramon Lorenzo Renzo Quinto. We know that the future belongs to the next generation and our next speaker belongs to that generation. Wait, Eric has come in, let us see. Eric got lost again. So let me just introduce Dr.
Dr. Ginto. So at such a young age, Dr. Ginto is Associate Professor of the Practice of Global Public Health and Inaugural Director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of the St. Luke's Medical Center, College of Medicine. He is also Chief Planetary Doctor of PH Lab, a global think and do tank for advancing the health of both people and the planet. He is an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader and Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow. Dr. Ginto is a member of several high level international groups, including Lancet Chatham House Commission on improving population health post COVID-19. Uh, this is housed at the University of Cambridge. Lancet One Health Commission at the University of Oslo. Also, he works with the University College London as advisory uh, member of the Advisory Council of Global Health 5050 and Editorial Advisory Board of the Lancet Planetary Health. He has served as consultant for various organizations, including the World Health Organization, the World Bank, USAID, International Organization for Migration, Healthcare Without Harm, and the Philippine Department of Health. As I mentioned before, Renzo is also from the um, University of the Philippines. He obtained his Doctor of Public Health from Harvard University and was included by Tatler Magazine in its Gen T list of 400 leaders of tomorrow who are shaping Asia's future. Renzo has traveled to and lectured in nearly 50 countries and published more than 100 articles in scientific journals, has published books and uh, popular media. Oh, and he directed uh, and produced short films that communicate the message of planetary healing to the world. So let us welcome Dr. Renzo Ginto, who will present planetary health, a new compass for a post COVID-19 future. Dr. Ginto. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to Paase first for welcoming me to be uh, one of your newest members. Special thanks to Dr. Gisela Concepcion for uh, the nomination. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, sharing with you some of my thoughts and ongoing work related to planetary health and, and COVID-19. Uh, and, and also to be speaking with uh, some of my teachers from the UP College of Medicine, Dr. Mingit Padilla, uh, Dr. Eric Domingo, and of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Francis C., who is... Um, you know, one of our um, illustrious alumni, both in UP, but also uh, at Harvard. So let me, sh can you see my slides now? And so I will, I hope you can see my slides now. Um, so first I wanna, um, you know, remind us all uh, about the origins of, of this ongoing pandemic. Uh, and we know that this is not uh, un unanticipated. Uh, we knew that it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you visit the website of the WHO, there's a list of uh, microbes uh, or pathogens of pandemic potential. And they included uh, disease X as a placeholder for that pathog pathogen that is still yet to be known. And lo and behold, uh, we were, um, you know, surprised that in 2019, uh, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, will emerge uh, in Wuhan, as already mentioned by Dr. C a while ago. Uh, and so, you know, this is, you know, yes, shocking, but not uh, surprising, because we already knew that this is going to happen. Unfortunately, we did not put in place the necessary systems to be able to address, contain, uh, and prevent uh, this uh, outbreak from turning into a pandemic. And, you know, we know that uh, the planet's health is essential to preventing infectious disease. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, research already showing that climate change, uh, the global environmental challenges that we are seeing right now are all contributing to both the reemergence of existing and old infectious diseases like malaria, dengue, but also the emergence of new ones, uh, you know, from uh, uh, unknown uh, coronaviruses, for instance, SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, I already mentioned climate change is uh, known as a threat multiplier, uh, especially to human health. We know that climate change will exacerbate 
health outcomes. If, as you can see in this diagram, I'll not belabor you with the details. Uh, there are multiple pathways that connect climate change with human health outcomes. And on your right, you will see that there is no disease group that is immune to climate change, whether it's chronic non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular diseases or infectious diseases such as the ones that I mentioned a while ago. Uh, there is, uh, you know, it's expected that there will be a reversal of 50 years worth of gains in global nutrition if we don't act on the climate. Uh, and there's growing body of work as well in terms of the impact of climate change on mental health. So I already mentioned dengue. In fact, in 2019, there were cases of dengue in even temperate regions where dengue as a tropical disease has never been seen before. And one of the hypotheses is that climate change has something to do with this uh, you know, expansion of the uh, uh, you know, disease uh, coverage uh, of tropical diseases such as dengue. We also know that it's not just climate change that is driving uh, the, uh, these infectious disease outbreaks. I mentioned environmental changes in general, you know, wildlife trade, for instance, that is still very much, uh, you know, popular and, and, and uh, happening, is including in Southeast Asia where we are located, uh, but also the destruction of natural ecosystems through deforestation, rapid uh, urbanization, uh, leading to uh, biodiversity loss. And then, of course, our agricultural systems, the food sector. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, future uh, outbreaks and even pandemics can erupt from, you know, poultry farms in the Philippines or uh, cattle ranches uh, in other parts of the world. And so we really need to understand and consider the environmental drivers of infectious disease emergence. There is a group that was just recently uh, established, pan preventing pandemics at the source. Um, you know, and, and this is really to remind ourselves, you know, while we are trying to address the current pandemic, we need to make sure that we have put in place the necessary systems to prevent the next one. As you can see in this map, there is this uh, belt of, of countries a lot, uh, in the tropical areas uh, where you know the next viruses or or other microbes with zoonotic potential can uh, cause uh, you know a future outbreak again if not a pandemic Southeast Asia uh, included and so we really need to make sure that the next pandemic does not happen and we can only do that if we will cut you know the uh, the pathways that enable uh, these zoonotic le leaps or spillovers. As you can see in this paper by Sokolo et al, you know, there's so many points or entry points where we can actually intervene through ecological approaches, uh, in, you know, ensuring uh, conservation, environmental conservation as well, uh, reforms in the food sector, so that this, uh, you know, pathways uh, can be interrupted and that zoonotic leap from, you know, a host or a reservoir uh, all the way to, you know, humans uh, do, does not occur. And there's actually a paper last year by Dobson et al. showing and estimating how much is needed to prevent the next pandemic. Um, you know, and as you can see here, only 2% of what they call the COVID-19 bill, the economic losses that are incurred by this current pandemic is needed in order to prevent the next one. So we really need to invest in infrastructure, in science, in research, in the personnel that will make sure the next pandemic does not happen. So this is also echoed, for instance, by ongoing talks uh, in the WHO. Uh, there is uh, now a proposed pandemic treaty to make sure that countries are able to report, for instance, uh, early on a timely manner, but also to make sure that we are able to detect these viruses even before they jump from an animal to a human being. There's a report uh, by the independent panel uh, led by the for, uh, former prime minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, and the former president of Liberia, Ellen Gel uh, Johnson Sirleaf, 
saying we need to make sure that COVID-19 is the last pandemic. And they came up with this range of recommendations, including establishing new global surveillance systems that bring together different sectors and disciplines. So we really need to have uh, you know, these uh, new systems put in place that bring together uh, not just the doc doctors of humans, such as myself and all my other co-panelists and the members of this uh, committee, but also, for instance, veterinarians uh, and experts in animal science, but also environmentalists, ecologists, uh, climatologists, for instance, to come together to address these problems at the animal, environment, and human interface. And you know, right now, I'm, I'm really pleased that there are some developments in terms of building this new infrastructure. Of course, these entities should have been established yesterday, not today, not even tomorrow. But still, um, you know, uh, it's never too late to make sure that we prevent the next one. You know, here in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, there are now talks about establishing our own regional CDC, Center for Disease Control. The African Union has one. The European Union has one. I think it's time for Southeast Asia, ASEAN, to establish one. The Philippines is about to establish a future virology institute. That's good news. UP Los Baños is establishing a national zoonosis center to you know, bring in together researchers studying bats, studying animals, studying agricultural systems. Uh, and we have new networks that have been established uh, like Siohon, Planetary Health Philippines, et cetera. We hope we can work together uh, in this uh, transdisciplinary approach. So we really need to remember that we live in an age of syndemics. The, the word pandemic has become very popular in this day and age of COVID. Pandemic means a disease that is present in most, if not all countries. Syndemic means uh, that there is an interplay of multiple epidemics happening at the same time. We should not forget that in addition to COVID, we have the pandemic of HIV AIDS, we have the pandemic of other neglected tropical diseases, the pandemic of non-communicable diseases, rising obesity, but also global undernutrition, the pandemic of mental health crisis, uh, or the epidemic of loneliness. And so we in this uh, commission, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Yasmin mentioned at the Lancet Chatham House Commission, we're now looking at this interplay of epidemics and what are the reforms that are needed at the global, national, and local levels to make sure that people's health and the planet's health are protected from these endemics. So, you know, Arundhati Roy, the Indian novelist, wrote last year that this pandemic is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And every time we enter a door, you know, we, we, we go to another uh, place, you know, we need a new compass. Although in the 21st century, no one uses a compass anymore. We use a Google map. So what is a Google map for the 21st century? And I think, you know, this Google map or compass is planetary health. Right now, I'm trying to visualize what is the situation of the world. It's not just people who are wearing masks. It's also Mother Earth wearing her own mask, not to protect herself from the unseen coronavirus, but from the global environmental changes that we are now seeing uh, in front of our very eyes. And so now, you know, our proposal is to have a, a shift and even an expansion of the ambit of public health to planetary health. And when we say planetary health, our patients are not just people anymore, but also the planet as well. And so in 2015, in the Lancet, uh, there is a Lancet Rockefeller Commission report that defined planetary health as the health of the human civilization and the natural systems on which it depends. And really when we talk about planetary health, we try to understand and study not just you know, the living creatures, great and small, including humanity, but also the abiotic factors, soil, water, uh, air, and also the social systems that drive all these changes, our political systems, the economy, our food systems, the way we migrate, uh, our industries, the energy system, so on and so forth. And, you know, planetary health, I think, is really the grand convergence of all these disciplines that we are already familiar with. Global health, tropical medicine, 
you know, conservation science, uh, the climate science as well, earth sciences, even social sciences is so, you know, are so critical in understanding planetary health problems, but also ethics and philosophy, because ultimately, you know, this uh, planetary health field is a re-examination of our relationship with Mother Earth. And so, you know, why planetary health? Right now, we are seeing massive environmental changes of anthropogenic nature, meaning these are all human-induced. As you can see in this uh, diagram, I'll not go into the details, our consumption and pat uh, production patterns, the demographic shifts that we see, aging, urbanization, migration, uh, but also the youth bulge in many other countries, and also technological advancement. All these creating new environmental you know, problems of pollution, biodiversity loss, climate change, which ultimately lead to a wide range of health outcomes, such as the ones that I mentioned a while ago. And central in the planetary health uh, you know, concept or discourse is the concept of the planetary boundaries. This was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And basically what is said, said here is there are nine planetary boundaries, quantitative limits, uh, that if we breach or violate these boundaries, the world becomes less habitable for the human civilization. And unfortunately, as you can see here, two out of the nine boundaries have already been violated, biosphere integrity or biodiversity. Over the past century, we've seen the fastest rate of extinction of creatures great and small. And then the other boundary that unfortunately has already been violated is a natural cycle or the natural biogeochemical flows of PNN, phosphorus and nitrogen because of our addiction to artificial fertilizers as part of large scale agriculture. And so, um, you know, two out of nine already violated, two out of nine are soon to be violated, climate change, we know that the Paris Agreement set a deadline, 2030, uh, and we should make sure we don't breach the two degrees Celsius global average temperature increase that is um, you know, established by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as the limit. Beyond that, the world will be much warmer and we will see more catastrophic impacts. And then of course, land system change is also another boundary over the past century, we've seen natural forest ecosystems turned into cities, subdivisions, golf courses. And so, and, and we know that that is also detrimental to the health of the soil and uh, biodiversity. Uh, and in fact, there's, uh, you know, the great biologist E.O. Wilson from Harvard even came up with a proposal, the half earth proposal, meaning the world should declare half of the earth, uh, especially, you know, our forests, to be left untouched in order to protect our land systems. So this is the state of the planet right now. And this definitely contributes to infectious disease emergence and to all the different health impacts uh, that I mentioned. And we know, unfortunately, that the Philippines is a climate hotspot. You know, this is in this map, the redder the country is, the more vulnerable the country is to climate change. The Philippines, unfortunately, is the reddest of them all. And, you know, and interestingly, because when COVID uh, showed up at our doorstep, I think people have forgotten that there is actually a climate crisis still evolving. And this map shows to you the many different climate impacts that we've seen last year and that we are expected to see in the coming years while we're still trying to fight the ongoing pandemic. In fact, in the Philippines, this is so real. Filipinos especially in Cagayan last year, in Bicol, they've been uh, faced with this dilemma. On one hand, do I stay in the house, protect myself from COVID, but uh, suffer, for instance, the inundation brought about by extreme flooding, or maybe the roof of their house will be blown away by the strong wind. On the other hand, they can relocate to these evacuation centers, temporary shelters, safe from climate change, but not safe from the coronavirus, because as you can see in this photo, there's no social distancing to begin with. And so, you know, what are the lessons, you know, from COVID uh, in terms of uh, planetary health? First, I think that the healthcare system that we have now, which is in a state of shock, we've heard from Dr. Domingo and Dr. Padilla, how their respective uh, institutions 
have uh, you know weathered uh, you know the the pandemic. Uh, but we know that the, the health systems that we have now are not ready for pandemics, and for sure we're also not ready for long-term climate change and other planetary crises. This is a dress rehearsal. Uh, for that, uh, unfortunately, uh, unstable uh, and uncertain future. We also have seen that our pandemic response is not necessarily uh, planetary health oriented and environmentally responsible. We've seen uh, a new form of pollution, PPE pollution, masks uh, polluting our waters and our beaches. Uh, and so while we are still uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we, not, we need to start thinking how can we make our response more climate and environmentally responsible? And last year, I'm pretty sure you've seen in the front pages of the newspaper, in social media, images of blue skies, clean air, you know, breathe, more breathable uh, air in Metro Manila. But the reality is that as countries reopen, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, and also particulate matter, are surging back. So this is from nature. And as you can see, the, the very instant uh, you know, countries have reopened, uh, we've just returned to pre-pandemic emissions level. So a pandemic and its lockdowns are temporary respite, but not a long-term and sustainable solution to the climate crisis. And so, you know, this is a report that I uh, had the privilege to co-write. We will be launching it soon. Uh, this is a report from the World Bank about how to incorporate climate smart interventions into the ongoing COVID response. And as you can see, this is the pandemic uh, response uh, curve. Uh, and we listed down several, uh, you know, and a lot of measures that we can incorporate from, you know, uh, addressing the, the uh, vaccine uh, rollouts and making sure our syringes are made of sustainable materials, all the way to putting in place the post-pandemic uh, infrastructure uh, that are climate uh, resilient and climate uh, and, and low carbon as well. I'll not go into detail. And you know, this is another report that we just published uh, recently about the convergence of pandemic response, climate resilience, and decarbonization. So you know, now that we're on the second year of the pandemic, you know, we are actively working, you know, with the WHO, with the World Bank, and hopefully soon with the Philippine government, with national governments, to make sure that in the coming years of the pandemic response, we are able to leapfrog and use the COVID moment uh, towards decarbonization and ensuring uh, and enhancing our climate resilience. We need to expand uh, our ambit and our vision for primary health care to include planetary health care. Uh, and we've written some papers, uh, you know, uh, ideating about what we can do within the healthcare system to make sure that it's not just responsive to the health needs of people, but also protecting the planet uh, in the long run. And I think that the 21st century health systems in the era of planetary health should not just be universal. In the Philippines, universal health coverage is still an unfinished business. We have to make sure that gets revived, especially next year as the national elections uh, are coming. But also we need the health systems in our country and around the world to be disaster ready, to be pandemic prepared, and ultimately to be climate adaptive, underpinned by this you know, values of justice, security, sustainability, and resilience. And we also need to expand our view, you know, from health systems to what we're now calling systems for health. You know, we know health systems are the hospitals, the health workers, the medicine supply that uh, the FDA uh, is regulating. But now we're introducing this new concept of systems for health, the energy system, the urban system, the agricultural system, the transport system, all the other systems outside of the health sector that are crucial for the improvement of health, both of people and planet. And so we really need a transdisciplinary and multi-sectoral approach. 
So I'm reaching the end, uh, the, the last part of my presentation, and I'm sure this has been uh, the most, uh, you know, popular graph uh, in social media. We need to flatten the curve of COVID-19. We also need to enhance the capacity of the healthcare system, add more beds, recruit more nurses, and now roll out more vaccines. And I think we need to flatten this curve too. I think this mantra is very much applicable to climate change and the planetary crisis to also make sure that we prevent the next pandemic. We need to bend the curve of our carbon emissions and our ecological footprint. Unfortunately, unlike in the previous graph, the Earth's capacity is unchangeable, it's constant, and therefore non-negotiable. We can't add more beds to enhance the Earth's capacity. And so the only option that we have is to flatten our own ecological curve. And so we need to make sure that the post-COVID recovery process from now until, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, is green, healthy, and just. And there's so many conversations now about the new economy. The WHO came up with a manifesto for a healthy recovery, which included uh, seven agenda items, including uh, protecting nature and transforming the food system. And so, you know, we need these broader conversations to complement uh, the uh, conversations that we have in terms of the immediate response, which, of course, is very important uh, because it will save lives as well. And of course, you know, we need more PPEs, personal protective equipment, but we also need a new kind of PPE, a people and planet oriented economy. And that is an economy that does not consume and pollute and produce as if the planet has endless limits. Instead, we need uh, this kind of economy that respects the planetary boundaries, but also ensures that the social foundation of people uh, is met. Water, food, health, education, gender equality, political voice, housing, energy access, so on and so forth. And so we would like to invite uh, our audience to join the Planetary Health Alliance. It's actually headquartered uh, in Harvard. It has already almost 300 members from around the world, member institutions. This is a photo from our first conference uh, in Boston in 2017, very transdisciplinary, but also very intergenerational from very senior Nobel Prize winning scientists all the way to emerging scholars such as myself. And as I've mentioned, you know, there are new uh, programs already being built uh, in many different parts of the world. Uh, a lot of them actually still in North America and Europe and actually in St. Luke's Medical Center last year, we established the Planetary and Global Health Program. But we also invite other universities that are uh, tuning in in this um, con uh, con convening to consider establishing your own planetary health programs. I would love to be of help. Join us, Planetary Health Philippines. Uh, visit planetaryhealth.ph. Look for us in social media and you will meet all the faces and voices of our growing planetary health community in the Philippines. And in fact, next week, we have an editorial in The Lancet launching the Planetary Health Philippines community. So we really are showing uh, you know, the way towards a better post-COVID future that considers both the health of people, but also the health of the planet. Because this is my personal dream, you know, after studying in the States for three years, and of course, having been familiar with Silicon Valley in California, the epicenter of technological innovation, I think that the Philippines can become the Silicon, not Valley, but the Silicon Islands of planetary health innovation. Let's make this a reality within our lifetime. And because we owe it to these children and we owe it to the future children of the Philippines, we want to make sure that these future children will not see any more new pandemics nor a climate crisis because we have done our part as um, you know, scientists and, and uh, the scholarly community. So together, let's advance the health of people and planet. Thank you very much for this opportunity and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Ginto. It's very encouraging that there are young people like you thinking of uh, global health and I, I will join the Global Health Alliance and I think a lot more people will join me. So we will close this, this uh, webinar with Dr. Francisco C, the part two of his talk. So let us ask.
Dr. C. Thank you. Okay, let me look for my slides and Can you see this? Okay, so I'll try to be very short. Uh, I have a few more slides to show you about the future. And uh, let's see. So CDC have their strategy. You can go to their website and look for it. And these are their goals uh, and uh, their objectives. Again, they're very long. So just go to the CDC website and look for their strategy, WHO also have their own uh, goals and, for, and response and again, go to their website. But here are a few points about the future of COVID-19. The likelihood of achieving herd immunity is very low because at present time, not all pe people in the world are fully vaccinated. And also a lot of the countries have still lack access to the vaccine. And in countries like the US, there's a large number of people who are vaccine hesitant or refuse for religious or other reasons. And we don't have vaccines for children yet. And also the vaccines do not really provide full immunity against infection. They may not prevent infection, but they may reduce severity of the disease or hospitalization and death. And right now there are different types of vaccines with different efficacy. And, and, and also we're not sure um, if some of these vaccines are effective against some of the new variants that are emerging. And then as the winter comes here in the US and other parts of the world, uh, the outcomes may depend on new variants that have emerged, how high is our vaccination rate, and of the most important is the human behavior. If people continue wearing masks and social distancing. So I think the most important is really uh, how to continue change your, your behavior. And uh, so the suggestion is to in intensify global vaccination efforts Hopefully the developed countries help the developing countries in terms of uh, vaccines uh, coverage, monitor the emergence of variants, uh, prepare for the search. Um, uh, in winter time, I think there might be a search as people get together, more spend indoor time. And then also when students return back to school and people return back to work, um, probably there could be some kind of mandatory vaccination, but that's questionable in the democratic country, but probably can ask people to wear masks and avoid super spreader events. And we might have to continue doing um, remote teaching. The most important really modify human behavior, especially those who are at high risk of getting uh, COVID. And my last chart is we're all, we're all in this together, each one teach one, each one reach one. We must all work together, promote our Bionian spirit, promote collaboration, promote community empowerment. Let's keep our faith strong and this too shall pass. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. We are now ready for any question. There was, there is a question from Dr. Dairi. So let me read that. Although COVID-19 is a public health concern, it is to recognize that comorbidities have a significant effect, why is there very little advice given on nutrition and healthy food, exercise, or vitamins, and others? So who would like to handle that? I, I think uh, that's what COVID-19 COVID is just the tip of the iceberg. So underlying that, uh, it's showing to us the health disparities in our population, the wealth disparities, also showing our lifestyle need to change. You can see that um, uh, people with comorbidities have higher risk of uh, severe outcomes and death. So a lot of uh, these are chronic diseases and uh, could be, uh, um, if you improve your lifestyle, physical activity and other things and better nutrition, then probably have less of those chronic diseases. So I think, um, there, there probably will be a change in people's lifestyle. Are they, you know, during the lockdown, people had no place to go, probably stay home and exercise. And I don't know what they do, but a lot of people, uh, it's, I think it's, it's a good question. I think uh, hopefully that's one thing that people would do. As, as I said, it goes back to human behavior and lifestyle, lifestyle changes. Dr. Dairit, you're here. So can you, um... 
further elaborate on your question or are you or you have any other question please uh, yeah well yeah thank you uh, well basically because um you know there's a list of um things you know uh, uh physical distancing etc but rarely do people talk about you know the daily things that they can do uh, nutrition uh, has already been pointed out um i uh dr ginto actually covered a lot of it it's um yeah, nutrition is very important. And um, actually, if we eat less meat, then you actually hit many, well, pardon the uh, no, birds with one stone, uh, you know, less land use, less, you know, the agriculture, you, you, you plant crops to feed people instead of animals. So it's it's also a um, system change. But, but you know, uh, with all the advice that, that comes out, um, there's very little mention of you know, uh, how people can take care of themselves uh, or countries can take care of themselves without having to put all their money into vaccines and medicines, uh, put them into nutritious food. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's just my um, comment. And, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, more advice on healthy living yep. <laughs> and exercise. And uh, there's a paper that was published that, uh, of course it was published by, uh, by you know sports doctors, and they claim that um, exercise um, solves a lot of the problems that uh, we see with um, you know with all, with all these um, comorbidities. Sorry, I yeah. think it's one of the things that they will consider like a, a silver bullet. Yeah, yeah. can exercise. I? Yeah, I'll jump in, no? Because uh, we, uh, Dr. Dairit already mentioned food. And by the way, Dr. Dairit, I'm not sure if you'll remember me. Great to be reconnected with you. More than 10 years ago, I attended my first env uh, environmental science uh, boot camp uh, under Bayer. Uh, and you were the, one of the speakers. And that was oh. quite, you know, uh, enlightening, a eureka moment. Oh, my God, I'm a doc medical doctor, but I want to work on climate change. So you're part of my... Uh, journey. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, Abby, with Abby Favis. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, nice you know, I hope you don't mind. I'll show you one or two slides because we're talking about food. Uh, Dr. Dairit already mentioned about meat consumption. And I did not include this uh, slide in my talk uh, because there's so much to talk about. Uh, but one planetary health nexus solution is actually the reduction of meat consumption, which I call here quadruple win. Because it will decrease non-communicable diseases. WHO already declared red meat and processed meat as carcinogens. It will reduce CO2 emissions. 15% of the total emissions of the world come from the animal industry. It will lower the risk of antimicrobial resistance as well because 75% of antibiotic misuse is not happening in human medicine. It's happening in, an, in the animal industry. And then of course, it will prevent zoonosis. And that's why, you know, you've heard about planetary health. There's actually one proposal, a planetary health diet. I invite you to look at this, uh, you know, influential paper. And as you can see, if we'll transform the global diet into a planetary health diet, you will see that you know, a very small portion is meat. And in fact, if you translate this into a week-long diet, it will equate to one meal per week. You know, maybe it's just your Sunday evening, you're eating meat. The rest should be plant-based. And of course, that's going to be a challenge in a meat-eating country like the Philippines. So, so yeah, um, this is just one area, right? Uh, meat transitioning to plant-based diet, which will solve multiple problems at the same time. There is a question from um, Dr. Serafica, uh, but Eric is still not getting into our thing, but I, this is a very important question that he asked. Um, is FDA, I mean, would, Dr. Serafica, you're here, so please ask your yes. question. Actually, uh, just you. since Thank the you. group is here already, I was with uh, Dr. Chong uh, last uh, two days ago, and we have discussed uh, because I've been helping UP system for the last seven years commercializing their technology. And this last two years, I've been developing medical devices to help the COVID fight from ventilators to sanitation pods to uh, 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 face masks and UV sterilizers. 
And a lot of these devices that have been funded by PCHRD of the OST last year are now coming down to the final phase of development, which is clinical validation. And that is the current value of death for most of development in the Philippines. And he did mention that uh, clinical trials for emergency use authorizations have been at least opened up uh, forcefully, hopefully by the pandemic, but uh, the medical device is still blocked. I have uh, one, three ventilators on the pipeline, one 11 years in development by Puns Balgos and another one just in current uh, uh, FDA emergency use authorization from a UK uh, collaboration. And none of them, none of them have made it to the clinic. So to me, that's very frustrating coming from a medical device. Uh, I had a medical device company for 17 years in the US and I've done, dealt with the FDA during those, those times for approvals. And I've been trying to crack this, this piñata for, for the last five years. It's really frustrating, but I, at least uh, with Eric mentioning what has been happening since he took on about a year ago and trying to catch up and forced to catch up, then hopefully we can do the same catch up on medical device development. So too bad. But uh, then again, uh, Yasmin, I think you're uh, in a direct line with him. Uh, I'm open to discussing it with the FDA together with Dr. Charlotte and Jojo Mandaring of the ERB and also the HTAC of DUH because a lot of these technologies will have to go through the Technology Assessment Council, which is formerly headed by Marit Terey as a former VCR of, or Chancellor of UT Manila. And even Chancellor mentioned, uh, again, this is an ongoing effort uh, between UP Diliman and UP uh, Manila to get this uh, development, not only on the, uh, uh, on the drug and vaccine and diagnostic side, but also on the device side, which I'm the one who's probably pushing hardest on it. Although I think I did see a big Ilan earlier as well in the group. But uh, again, thank you for actually inviting such a group. I'm very impressed. Again, I'll save the questions for donor sites because I was med developing medical implants uh, uh, as a substitute for donor, donor, uh, 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 donor cornea <laughs> before as one of the projects. I, I do a lot of uh, duraplasty uh, replacement as one of my oh. uh, products that went to the clinic. But uh, that's another area. Again, these are all in the field of devices and regulatory is the biggest block as well as the clinical validation, which we encountered at the diagnostic phase for our locally COVID kit developed by Raul Vistula. So I just want everyone to be aware. I mean, uh, we all have our own ecosystems. Uh, I mean, I know Toby is in the, the whole uh, pre-nutritional uh, 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 aspects. And I know uh, I've seen the global side from Renzo. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> I don't know. Are you going to tackle that uh, down to the uh, drill down to the local level? But good luck. <laughs> and definitely uh, uh, Dr. Uh, D uh, in, in, in the U.S. would love to uh, continue the dialogue in terms of uh, providing us with guidelines because I think that's the next phase where we're at. To conclude, we need guidelines for the local uh, FDA to be assisted in all of these undertakings, guys. And I think that's the own, one of the best ways we can help them because in the US, if I develop a product, there's always an FDA guideline uh, for me to look at in order to at least chart the pathway for the development and estimate the budget and the time and the personnel in order to get to the finish line. And believe me, I've been here for seven years. Only one made it to the finish line. Dr. Boons, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Axis Knee of Dr. Gustillo, a co award at the last, last year. And he was mentioning to me that how difficult it's been uh, for him uh, and funding it himself uh, together with the OST's support as well. But uh, again, I represent the medical device space uh, in and uh, having all you doctors available to us here uh, to discuss in the future, not today, in the future, I seek your help and guidance as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Serafika, I will be sure to tell Eric to get in touch with you. So he might call you and I also email your group or you. Yeah, I'm past president of Paase as well. So I mean, channel it through to Giselle. Giselle is uh, part oh, okay. of our team, definitely. Of but, uh, we can assemble the team in terms of we have a medical device focused discussions on, yeah, on development, that, medical that, device that, development, which is your also part of your group. I think uh, uh, that will be excellent as a follow on yes, this. Thank yes, you. That is better. That is better because we yes, have so mm -hmm. many entrepreneurs and new drugs and new devices, but 
as you said, nothing is coming out. Yes, Giselle, please. So uh, that's indefatigable, irreplaceable ulcerafica. <laughs> Same with Toby Dairit, former past pres uh, former president of PASE also, and now vice president of the NAST. So Yasmin, you are critical. You are the conduit to your fellow ophthalmologist, FDA director, Eric Domingo. Try to get our uh, recommendations over to him for him to consider very carefully. There's one other person here who's very vocal about perhaps how we could improve our, um, uh, well, uh, uh, how to address COVID. And that is um, Vic Ilag. Are you still here? Nah, he, he jumped out, not yourself. Oh, no, I'm still here. Right. Sorry, I'm still oh, here. Oh, there. Okay, yeah. now he's yeah. 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 Good job. Yeah. Good job. Sorry. Good. Because, Good. Um, yes, uh, his um, ideas yes. resonate with <laughs> any of what yeah. you said, including Toby's. Yes, uh, Vic. I know, just more a follow up, I think, with Giselle's issue on the povidone iodine, I think, which Dr. Padilla also covered, and probably addressed also to Dr. C. I think the current um, measures used, like physical distancing, masks, um, washing hands, I mean, are good. I'm not against them, but I think they're insufficient. Because remember, this virus breeds in the mouth and the nasopharyngeal area. And once you quarantine somebody, I mean, even you put several masks or physically distance even 12 feet, the virus is still replicating. So if you look comparison to dengue, I mean, there's a 4S. The strategy really is to reduce the amount of virus particles from multiplying. So prevents variations or um, from a formation of variants. So why not use a simple, safe method? And we've been proposing, as Giselle pointed out, we sent the letter, or Giselle sent the letter to the office of the president. Essentially, everybody who has uh, uh, COVID-19 just has to have a gargle of povidone iodine and even a nasal spray and even an eye drop. And I think I posted there a clinical trial dial done in Bangladesh. And that would significantly reduce transmission. And it's simple. I mean, nothing fancy about that. This is not even ivermectin, but although we have another question with regards to that. <laughs> but this is yeah. but this simple an issue. Could you imagine everybody quarantine, even in the airport? If you quarantine somebody, they usually go in a closed air-conditioned room. We know this aerosolized, so it would stay there. So by the next time the occupant comes in, and actually you do, that's a bit of natural selection. Whichever is the most stable viral particle then infect the next person inhabiting. But if everybody, regardless of whether they have symptoms or not, especially the asymptomatics, gargle three times a day or in quarantine, PVP iodine, the likelihood of you getting or even spreading within yourself and then propagating viruses would then be reduced. I mean, this is what we proposed, but we were shot down, <laughs> but there's no clinical evidence. I mean, what clinical evidence would you need? This is just common sense. Just like there's no clinical trial that washing hands will reduce COVID-19. But we do it because it makes sense. But why not this simple one, which would just make perfect sense? I mean, this just, and if you look at it, Australia, so I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, most, we have barely any infection. We actually have two uh, several weeks ago, and we have to completely shut down. But all of the leaks are actually from quarantine. So could you imagine, this could be easily stopped. But somehow the protocol is not being followed. So that's why we're appealing. I mean, we're not MDs. <laughs> we don't have the license. So that's where I think, especially from authorities, usually the messenger makes a, uh, a big difference. So, so you, you, uh, men this you, makes mentioned, sense. you mentioned that you submitted the proposal to the president the president of UP or the president? Oh, of no, the no, Philippines? president of the president Philippines. Of, <laughs> I wrote okay. the letter. So Philippines. I wrote the letter and uh, well, uh, then uh, the executive secretary's office replied, thank you. We referred to the DOH and to the uh, experts. And of course we know the experts are the living CPG. Those are all UPMDs and researchers. And they came back very, um, uh, well, quickly to say that uh, there's not uh, sufficient evidence. Okay, so um, 
uh, this is uh, what we so want to endeavor. <laughs> Eric about. And I think one right? of the links, yeah, yeah, one of the links I put there actually was from a study in Singapore. Anyway, so. But but uh, uh, Vic, we were supposed to plan a clinical local. Yeah, clinical that's trial it. To support this. Not and yes, <laughs> yeah. we encountered resistance from yeah. almost everybody. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You yeah. think the doctors would say, well, grab on. Okay, we'll just do no. uh, But being able to find the testing facility to complement. Yeah, that was a challenge as well. It was so already challenging. So, guys, uh, you have to understand our situation here in the Philippines. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, definitely, uh, we'd, we'd love to be able yeah. to get guidance from you guys, but we have yet to localize still uh, the practice of medicine or medical research and uh, I've been cracking that <laughs> for the longest times in devices and I hope this pandemic will get us going. There are indications that we are moving faster, uh, definitely from diagnostics, uh, hopefully some of the, uh, 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 what do you call this, uh, herbal cures as well as some food supplements that Toby and the USD has spearheaded, but we, we need more, we need more examples of of working, uh, working uh, collaborations with, especially from the U.S., uh, Dr. D, and and uh, definitely we'd love to be able to uh, uh, get our past members, which we're doing already in various fields, from 3D printing with Gobet and uh, uh, with uh, Carlito Librilla and Metabolomics. Those are the kinds of things uh, that uh, are already in place, and uh, we need, just need more examples in the medical field. Yes, Giselle. Yes, uh, Al, I think at this point, because uh, we have a growing number of uh, PASA members who are, um, uh, well, uh, taking a more holistic and long-term approach uh, relating to, um, you know, interventions in nutrition and health and uh, the environment. Uh, just uh, remember, we have a venue for sharing our ideas as a group. That's a COVID bulletins, okay? So uh, there's no limit to the number of COVID bulletins that we could co-author. So how about uh, uh, Drs. Francis C. and uh, Renzo Ginto take the lead and then we'll chime in or we'll continue, uh, uh, well, feeding you uh, the ideas based on our local experiences. And Yasmin can always point this out to uh, FDA Director Eric, his nephew, or she's the tita of Eric, and he'll never refuse her, right? <laughs> yeah, I, kinda, I like that line there. That's what yeah. he That's what he what, 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 Filipinas, so it helps that we are interconnected. That's family. Yes. 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 Okay. And, and he understands that these are yes. we are scientists. I told yes. him specifically yes. these are scientists who really, you know, and the, uh, Dr. Yes, I mean, the, the main uh, proponent yes. for UP Manila is Ewang. Oh, yes, I know him. Okay, yes. so, so definitely I just support Ewang's Seabol group in UP Manila. And we have our team of tech transfer and business development group in UP system in Diliman as well, that we all work together. Engineers and scientists and doctors are so, all being trained for uh, design control and that uh, FDA methodology that I've been acquainted in the US for 20 years. So we, we are trying to get it okay on the academic side. It's the regulatory that we need to uh, be in lockstep. To work on. Oh. To clarify, uh, uh, Yasmin, uh, Gal is referring to uh, the clinical trials for the medical devices. Yes. Okay, we yes. already know that the DOST has agreed to conduct the clinical trials for ivermectin. Okay, and the <laughs> lead person of that is Eileen Wang, the wife of e Wang. Okay. Yes. Now, ito namang sa Povidon iodine. My letter consisted of a parang support, requesting for support for Povidon iodine. Pero gusto rin namin mag clinical trial jan with the private sector or in PGH. The lead person there in PGH is Joey La Pena. Okay? So, merong mga ganyang mga requests tayo. No? Of course, we know yung VCO uh, uh, publication is out your clinical trials. No? So I request the PASA community and I was um, uh, asking Vince Faustino, who is our expert on clinical trials. No? Yun lang wala siya ngayon. He's a co-chair of this uh, rec. Um, he should take a look at the study, uh, Toby, okay? for constructive comments and suggestions. Yeah, I work with Vince, by the way, on the early Yes. Months. 
uh, oh, yeah. April, May last year on the ventilator project with Dr. Boots Valgos and oh, oh. in Hawa in La Salle and TIP. And okay. now I'm helping also uh, IMI with their Ventura uh, from the UK MHS approval EUA as well. But I got, again, I, I, I offer my services pro bono and always been helping these teams. And I always get the black and the regulatory and the, uh, at least the, the uh, IRB side of things are already receptive, but they still look for guidance from the regulatory. So I think uh, what they did, uh, what uh, Eric just mentioned about opening up on the medic, on the drug side, we can replicate that in the device side. That would be good. At least that will uh, accelerate our development, local development. I think uh, Vic wants to say something, Pero. I want to address this to uh, Renzo because very impressive, Renzo. You are a great science communicator, and you are now with SLMC. So you know that PASE is really moving towards uh, linkages with the private sector, aside from the government. So we have MOU with DOST. While SLMC could be a prime mover, and so Leon, uh, you know that um, for uh, education, uh, science communication. Uh, we uh, need the private sector as well. And we are connected now with Knowledge Channel and ABS-CBN. So yun yung synergy, yung, yung syndemics, pero the, the uh, positive side of it is yung synergy for positive things. So let's capitalize on this. Walang organization as big as uh, PASE covering all the disciplines, okay? Uh, that, uh, well, well uh, the members can work together to make a big dif difference. And so I think you are a prime mover and you are a, like a leader now and in the yes. future. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. And we need more and young blood in Paase. <laughs> I meet grabe. So we have 100 new members. Makahanap lang ako ng five leaders, new young leaders. Wow. Fantastic, no? Ayan si Aini. You good men. And women. Curious lang ako. Ano bang undergrad mo, Renzo? Si Aimee, alam ko na, UPLB yan. Grabe. Ikaw, Renzo, saan ka galing? Intermed ako, ka? Ano? Intermed ako, ma'am. Oh my God. Ano ba? Naririnig ng public. Oh my God. Intermed ka. Itigil na natin. Ano bang 2004 ka ba? 2005? Naku, ano? mamalalaman yung age ko. 2005 ang ID number. Oh my gosh. Kailangan mo si Bea. Anak ko si Bea. 2004 grad. Medicine. Uh -oh. Agroman. Renzo, Renzo, I have a comment on one of your slides. Sure. Uh, because of the comments of Vic and uh, Dr. Serafika, Dr. Ilag, and Dr. Dairit, your one of your slides has like um, the biological, the social sciences. You forgot the legal framework. So you have to put the legal framework in that slide of yours. Because as you as you uh, as already pointed out by Dr. Serafika Eri, like that's a big block, stumbling block mm -hmm. for all of us. So let's them there where we can see them right away that they are important, the legal framework. Right. Right. You know, in right. the ethics yeah. and legal framework. Yeah, true. And I, I, I've just borrowed that slide from another professor, but I think they were I'll put. Tell they, him. They, I'll tell him. I'll make a new one. But also, I think they clump all the social sciences together. Yeah. But I, I agree, ma'am. No, and we have to be very specific, uh, especially when it comes to to the law and and the role Correct. of governance Correct. policy. Correct. Dagdag mo yon. yon. Any so more comments? in particular, yeah. yes, me, yeah. no? as uh, yeah. well, uh, shown by uh, Eric, napaka-importante ng ano, yes. uh, legal framework, IRR, and yan na, implementation. May dyan doon tayo nagkakaroon ng problema. And Ranzo, okay. so I just mentioned it on the site that uh, there is a, a, a activity on the National Academy of Science on feeding Metro Manila in yeah. 2050. And I think you're if you have not been invited, so Dong Rasko are the ones organizing that part. Uh, clearly, uh, we need to tap into the global uh, effort as well. So I took a picture and gonna of your uh, collaborations in that area and, and, and give it to Dong. Uh, Thank you, sir. But definitely, this is for us. It's really a networking uh, site. Also, again, I may be joking about asking for a few good men and women. <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> that, that was of course the movie, but uh, definitely. This is a good venue to show hands for people who want to collaborate and uh, come to the interface. 
and make a difference. And I think uh, thanks for doing that, Renzo. And uh, I mean, of course, you're uh, part of the, the, the responsible uh, uh, young uh, group yeah. in your uh, Rex, and definitely, uh, Yasmin, thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, 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 roster of speakers. And uh, But we need to drill down to the heart of the problem yes. after we've identified it. And we did today. And uh, you have the three people here on uh, Toby and Vic who have been pushing also the envelope on COVID-19 last year with us. And, and definitely, uh, that's why we're still here. We're still looking for solutions and new collaborations as well in order for us to keep advancing the uh, the field. So thank you. I'm so thank glad you for your team. I'm so I glad. Need, I need to go. I have another 11, 11 o'clock. Yeah. So. I'd like but to recognize um, Sean Raimundo, Al. So this is our... Oh yeah. Hi, Sean. Why did you not show it? Why did you not show it? Kamusta lang si Sean, okay? Pero uh, also recognize... Meron si akong question dyan. Ayun, ano uh, uh, question, question more, Sean? Ano Magkita ka naman, paano makita ka naman? It's in the chat group. It's in the chat. Ito oh, rin ako kasi ang dami. Okay, Renzo. Okay. Sige. Just anyway, information, Al. Uh, you know, Sean is recuperating, okay? From her oh. treatment. Kaya, yes. Yes. Give Did you see the question, Renz? Uh, I'm trying to locate. Uh, para okay, I can, I can say it. <laughs> Sige yes, po. please. Sige po. Okay. I just said, Renzo, your talk was great. And I was impressed with all the new terms that you introduced. But your concept of planetary assistance for, what was that? System for health. Systems for health. Yeah. Is the Philippines already practicing that? Or what should the Philippines do to be within that concept that you propose? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for that question. Uh, it's, it's, you know, on one hand, it's a new term, but also on the other hand, we always say it's old wine in new bottle because we already <laughs> knew even before that okay. health is not created within the medical sector. It's actually, you know, created outside of it. Uh, but we even in the health professions are not equipped, for instance, to, you know, interact, you know, with other sectors and disciplines. That's why Paase perhaps is a good platform to enable medical doctors like me to interact with, let's say, uh, a marine scientist like Dr. Concepcion. Uh, so, you know, you know, this interdisciplinary uh, platform will enable us to, uh, again, um, harness the systems for health. Um, and I, but, but right now, I think because of COVID, because of climate change, because of the pandemic, uh, there's now a growing, uh, not just interest, but uh, really push no, for uh, greater collaboration across sectors. No? I mean, I think decades ago, we're not even talking about the food system as uh, a potential uh, source of, of pandemics. Now, there's a more aggressive uh, push for transforming diets uh, and uh, protecting ecosystems to make sure that this is the last uh, pandemic of its kind. So, ma'am, it's a new concept, very young, and I think we need to um, have this more of more of these conversations and hopefully Paase will be the platform. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you too. And I think Doc Luli, uh, National Scientist Luli Cruz has the planet uh, Future Earth, Future uh, Earth. Uh, already as well. And I, uh, yes. there was also one health that was proposed during your time, Giselle, as BPAA and UP in Los yeah. Banos by a group. And um, UP Manila. At, yeah, uh, ah, but uh, you know. One health, uh, both Focusing on vet and, uh, right. and medicine, okay. so I, I think uh, definitely having a young, uh, energetic guy like you, uh, Renzo, to uh, yeah. uh, shout out at the rooftops that uh, we're you're willing to uh, uh, help out uh, will we'll definitely uh, invigorate these groups as well. And but uh, definitely uh, learn and collaborate and then adapt uh, uh, as as I always learn from being part of USAID stride. <laughs> That's my part. So definitely. Uh, thank you guys. I'm happy to uh, look forward to your next session and uh, I'll have to sign out. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. So thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. Because we all have a chemistry background. So Yasmin was a BS Chem Cum Laude graduate before she went to med. And I almost went to med, but I didn't. Okay, so I stayed in biochem. Now mm -hmm. I think Toby, Yasmin, Vic, uh, Renzo, Amy, Puros chemistry ang background niyan. Actually, biology ako. Biology, biology. Ka, pero ito, 
kem na rin. So, bottom line, uh, Renzo, is because you are an MD and a uh, PhD in public health, parang we want to uh, emphasize also the value of basic research. Lahat naman ng mga drugs, molecular medicine yan, lalo ngayon, you want to understand uh, the structure, the chemical structure of the drugs, and then how they interact with their targets. Okay? You mentioned that I am from uh, Marine uh, Biodiversity Research, and that's exactly what we do. We're looking for uh, drugs for the next-gen infections, uh, drug-resistant uh, bacterial infections, for example. So I think kailangan bigyan naman ng more balanced emphasis ng scientific community and uh, medical community ang mga results from the labs. And now, punong-puno ng mga published uh, papers, Nature, Journal of Antibiotics, etc., yung mga mechanisms of action ng mga compounds, pure drugs, hindi rin lang herbals. So ano yung comment mo dyan, Renzo? How do you get the medical community to accept these types of research? At hindi rin lang yung kino randomized clinical trials. Napakarami namang ding that uh, would go wrong there. I just gave a talk in UP Manila's Research Integrity Webinar Series on uh, F and F, uh, fraud, falsification, and fabrication. Okay. Lalong uh, complex yung study like an RCT, eh, lalo namang maraming mga, uh, you know, uh, opportunities or cases of fraud. No, whether misconduct, whether deliberate or not. Parang I'd like to hear from Enzo on this. And it only takes eight people or seven people to keep the discussion going and to come up with new initiatives. Okay? Yes, yeah. Enzo. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, that's a very big question. And now yeah. I'm trying to reflect on my personal experience. Yeah. Um, and, and thanks, ma'am, for uh, uh, saying that, you know, you know, um, um, uh, in terms of science communication, um, I think we need to have uh, more of that. Uh, I don't know if there's a program, for example, for emerging early career uh, Filipino scientists from all disciplines and from bench to the real world, right? I think, you know, yes, basic science is important. Clinical science is important. Population science is important. Planetary science is important. So that, you know, it's an entire spectrum. But I think, one, we need to come up with a platform that brings us all together. And number two, a program that will train all of us to be better communicators, not just in the journals, but, you know, if we get invited by, you know, popular media, by, by uh, CNN, by Rappler, right? We're, we will be able to communicate our, sci our complicated science in a simple and understandable way. So, so maybe that's a future PAASA initiative to train us not just in the technical but in the communication, in the diplomacy aspect, because you know, as we've been hearing, this is there's a lot of diplomacy involved in science as well. Right. Hmm. So, Yon, uh, there is a Rec 14 on science education and communication. Please join that, Renzo. No, and I think that uh, SLMC could play a major role in uh, communicating um, basic science. I actually uh, published a paper with my uh, uh, master's graduate, Jordan Tun, who's a graduate of your uh, School of Medicine, but a master's in um, molecular medicine, okay? It's on cancer naman, and it's synergistic uh, use of a marine compound with doxorubicin, okay? So it's a subject of patent application in UP. So Renzo, I think you and I, me, in this uh, batch of... Uh, as a member should play a critical role. I mean, yes, please, no? Uh oh, please become a very, very active. Try to be here <laughs> and help out. <laughs> so wonderful. Okay, so, uh, Yasmin, thank you so much. Oh, for this opportunity. Thank the speakers. Yeah, really, very good. Yeah, yeah, very good, good discussion, you know, from the small front lines, yes. not small, but from the frontliners to the global thing. That is really um, oh. huge. You have, yes. So it looks like Renzo himself has to leave for another meeting. So, yeah. Thank you. Sean, to, to, to my baby. It's 10 o'clock um, p.m. now. <laughs> I see. I mean, he's a cancer researcher in, uh, in, the, in Texas, Austin. 
Okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Happy weekend. Great resource from UPLB. Talaga, Yasmin. Lahat sila, UPLB. Yes, sikat na UPLB. Sean, Homer. Grabe. Oo, major block. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Very committed. Very committed pa as a numbers. Everyone here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Richmond, thank you so much. Yan, Richmond is a great communicator. Todo, no?